This island serves as a stopover for passengers navigating with these to other Caribbean islands, North America, or even Europe. The website of the Global Organized Crime Index also states that Venezuelan boats typically enter Dominican territory and transfer cocaine to local fishing vessels that transport it from the open waters into our island, Dominica. Can we blame them for this illegality? Yes, we can. Dominicans support the narcotics passage to more lucrative markets such as Guadeloupe and Martinique after they have been stored on the island for a short time. Similarly, as is the situation with cocaine, Dominica serves mostly as a transit and storage point for cannabis destined for other countries, but they still end up here in the region. However, Dominica happens to be a modest cannabis producer itself. As we all know, this cannabis production usually takes place in mountainous areas, remote mountainous areas. Majority of society also uses drugs such as alcohol, tobacco, and prescription medicines. Yes, prescription medicines are classified as drugs. This is true at pastime events, in their daily lives, and on the weekends. Current population stands at 72,292 individuals as of Sunday, March 20th, 2022, where 10.2%. 3% is above 64 years old, and 22.9% is below 15 years of age. Our National Youth Parliament has outlined that the youth is represented by individuals here between the ages 18 and 35. Currently, 66.8% of individuals in this country are between ages 15 and 64. So here we can make a rough estimate of who we are referring to when we speak about the youth, I believe. Knowing now what percentage of the population is, be is below 15 years old, may I remind you 22.9%, and the amount of people older than 64 years old, we can make a rough estimate, as I said, of who we are referring to. In regards to the youth that should benefit in Dominica's progressive efforts, as it will be their first times having access to guaranteed, solid, economical, health and lifestyle foundations in their country. Ladies and gentlemen of the house, what are the youth doing? Well, they're working, they're either not working, they're either in school, or seeking well, let's be honest, jobs that pay better rates so that they could live more financially fulfilling and comfortable lives. Wow. According to the youth, people are struggling too much in Dominica. According to the youth of Dominica, the members of the public, Dominicans are struggling too much. These are the majority that are not able to afford the luxury of five-star hotels or even the tertiary education. These people. There are aren't many career options created in the country, and we must create careers. That way the youth don't feel like they have to leave the island to live more fulfilling lives. If marijuana is legalized, it should be to provide a new means of personal elevation to everyone in the country, especially the youth. Currently, the youth are struggling to live financially stable lives, whereas the baby boomers hold most of the country's assets. Mr. Speaker, while our sister island, like St. Vincent, 
and the Grenadines are ready for the medical marijuana industry, are we? The youth aren't planting food in their gardens with their family members. So should we expect that they are thinking of buying land for agricultural purposes? What happens then to the vast rolling hills and the acres and acres of untouched land in Dominica? Does the state then reclaim these, um, these vast acres for economic systems for marijuana propagation. My intuitions tell me that this is possibly the most feasible option. But we must educate the able-bodied men and women about marijuana and its potential by providing them jobs in the industry and let the children learn from their parents. And the youth, Mr. Speaker, they are, they are aware of the impact that marijuana has on this country and the impact that it may have on a country's economy. Will the proposing side be prepared to expound on the strides that our Caribbean sister islands has embarked upon regarding the holistic use of the hemp plant besides in the medical profession. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday, 5th March 2022, I happened to have engaged in conversation with a hardworking woman a mature mother of two and citizen of this country. She stated to me that even the little kindergarten students didn't stop going to school despite the pandemic and its social restrictions. The primary and high school students have just now restarted attending classes in the physical and college students have also been submitting school assignments and studying the lecture material as they are being assigned. Mr. Speaker, arise on a point of order of relevance. The honorable member is speaking, but we're trying to, we're struggling to find out of marijuana and the economic opportunities for the youth. We are here to debate this matter, Mr. Member. What is the relevance that you think? When the family as a unit was encouraged to teach their young and sayings like it takes a village to raise a child were proverbs widely used agriculture and farming was of vital importance to health civilization spiritual and societal prosperity and was practiced frequently today this is not the case 
This is not the case because the agricultural industry has been disregarded for so long. Supplies and materials for commercial farming have not been supplied to farmers in positions to successfully carry it out. And there has been no export routes and systems maintained that generate revenue to the country and its many hardworking peasant farmers on this island. Peasant farmers uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that word, I'm peasant. I, I think it's a bit degrading to farmers. So if you could just withdraw that word and then you may proceed. All right, yes. All right, so you, you say withdrawn. Um, I withdraw the term peasant farmers. Okay, all right, you may proceed. I would like to substitute the term for the small farmers, the small scale farmers. Thank you. Small scale farmers who once had help and encouragement to endure the hardship of growing crops to feed and maintain the masses. The integration of online learning and wireless telecommunications has led the youth as a whole to be extremely dependent on online activity and their technological devices, whether for sudden notifications or sourcing important information. The feats of technology and its subtle blossom in our everyday use is very significant because from a random selection of active social media users, it was sought to gather from available digital public to answer two questions within 24 hours. 106 individuals viewed these questions and out of these, 34 individuals took the time to reply. Those questions intended to find out how much time are the youth spending off of their phones or connected to online digital platforms. I say this to bring the point across that propagation of any agricultural product requires time and dedication. Time and dedication or they will turn bad or not grow at all. Much like taking care of a pet or raising a child. Out of the 33, out of the 34 individuals, the majority responded that they had purchased their own devices and they were using their devices all the time rather than not. Using, both, using the examples of raising a child and the... Mr. Speaker, I rise again. I mean, we, we would like to be kind to the young man, you know, but um, we are struggling to find the relevance of your arguments, sir. Member, Mr. Member. I'm sorry. Yeah. And another point of order, Mr. Speaker, and please, if you would be able to advise the member on the proposing side that standing order 43A makes reference to while the member is still standing, he must wait for the member to t take his seat before he makes his contribution. Because it's very distracting that when a member is speaking that you are, and it has the floor, that you step up to make a contribution while he's speaking. So to allow him to please sit, then he can raise his point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, thank you very much, Honorable Members. I, I take both your points. Um, yes, um, Honorable Lander, you are correct that um, the, the member who is on his feet should yield before um, the, the person who jumps on a stand of order should continue. However, with, with that being said, um, once again, tend to agree with the the Honorable Gregoire in terms of relevance of the, the specific matter at hand. So once again, I just want to caution you and just remind you to, to remain relevant to the topic at hand. All right, thank you very much, Honorable Members. Um, Honorable Maxime, you may proceed. Um, and just to let you know, you, you have approximately three minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time and dedication is required for the propagation of marijuana and all the agricultural products that can be produced from the island. The youth are, admitted, are admittedly too occupied coping with emotionally unavailable parents, 
coping with traumatic experiences such as natural disasters, coping with malicious individuals within the environment ceasing to provide good moral examples of how to carry themselves. Mr. Speaker, what do we mean by marijuana being economically beneficial to the economy, particularly to the youth? Does it mean that percentages of revenue from the cash crop will be placed into bank accounts held by the youth individuals? Or does it mean that the youth will be at the forefront of cultivation? I ask this court, excuse me, suppose the youth do not have the strength or the wisdom to guarantee a sizable return on their own. What will the masses say then? It is my opinion and the opinion of a large number of farming individuals from Grand Bianis environs, Rose and its environs, Petit Savan, as well as Delices, that the youth and the economy of this country would benefit greatly from the holistic upgrade of the agricultural sector in Dominica, rather than this one act of simply legalizing marijuana for its economic benefit. Coffee, for example, was an exported product. Citrus fruits were grown in acres, pineapples, bananas, and plantains, mostly things that are now small scale today. They were flourishing and they were generating a lot of revenue for the country. Now, with marijuana, I urge this parliament to understand that society's youth have moved to the modern digital phase of pursuing success and comfortable lifestyles. So they might not be adequately prepared to take on the feats and the challenges that will come from the propagation of marijuana or the flourishing of marijuana in their society today due to all the negative examples already being exposed to them. The necessary monetary allocations intended for the outcome of our debate topic here today can also be put to use for acquiring the supplies to facilitate holistic agricultural development, as well as contracts for permission and value estimates to supply the yield abroad, in accordance with foreign policy, of course, to the United Nations and developed nations like Colombia, as well as countries such as Asia and the Americas by the airways and the seaports. The economic benefits that would be generated from the legalization of marijuana are benefits to the entire country's citizens and ultimately the Caribbean. However, only beneficial to the youth if they are involved in the cultivation and or distribution of the crop. The youth then have the option to stimulate the economy by attending school to learn proper agricultural practices and provide economic benefits as well to society if these opportunities are granted. Honorable member, you have just about one more minute to wrap up. Agriculture, as the shadow minister of blue and green economy, agriculture and national food security, may I ask, Mr. Speaker, aren't we making more of a sustainable and meaningful impact if we provide these opportunities to the youth? In the service of Dominica and my fellow citizens, we have promised to work diligently and to help build a prosperous and peaceful nation. I challenge the parliament of the honorable members to carry out this initiative, which will benefit Dominica's economy for the Dominican citizens, patriots, and especially the youth, 21 and below. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your time. Yes, I recognize Honorable Michael Allen. Um, once again, I, I encourage honorable members to please, when you, when you come to present, just state your name again and, and your portfolio or shadow portfolio for the, the listening media. All right, thank you. You may proceed. With your, le with your leave, Mr. Speaker. I ask to refer to my notes for my contribution, please. Yes, permission granted. You may proceed. Greetings to all. 
I am Michael Allen, the shadow minister or the youth minister for, I'm the youth minister for, sorry, sorry, hold on. Greetings to all. My name is Michael Allen. I am the youth minister for the blue and green economy, national security, or agriculture and national security. I extend a blessed good afternoon to the, to the deputy speaker or the speaker of the house, Honorable Philip Rowe, other ministers, other honorable ministers of the house, invited guests, remote viewers, the press, and most importantly, our youth. Mr. Speaker, why should a plant, a plant handcrafted by the God who blesses this nation, one of prodigious medicinal value and substantial promise to our democratic economy, be illegal? Yes, having potentially adverse effects, its objection may be anticipated but its prescription or illegalization could be, can be viewed as comparatively harsh, as every rose has its thorn. If we were to be all judged solely by the handful of times that we displayed our impertinent nature, instead of our profuse actions and numerous positive attributes, should we then all be subject to persecution? To put into perspective, why should cannabis, with its remarkable profitability and very abund and abundant benefits, receive a despicable reputation by having its very few flaws put under a microscope? Today, I'm here to offer an alternative. I'm here to flip the script. I'm going to highlight or bring to light what should have been cast out of the darkness years ago instead of perpetrating the misconstrued characterization of marijuana. Mr. Speaker, therefore, I too proudly rise in support of the topic of dispute. Legalization of marijuana can provide economic benefit, particularly for the youth. As the Youth Minister of the Blue and Green Economy, Agriculture and National Food Security, my research entails the prospect of economic development, particularly for the youth, through the legalization of commercial cannabis with regards to my ministry. Rather than conducting all my research from foreign sources, I found it of paramount importance to highlight and trust the vast knowledge and credible, the vast knowledge credible local and regional individuals have collated on this topic over the years. I also pray that for the personal integrity of these interviewees, I relay their information properly and profoundly. Mr. Speaker, the agricultural sector is well on its way to being revolutionized with its decriminalization of cannabis already being enacted. We must take the next step to legalization, transition from retrogressive mindsets and, and traditions and delve into the new realm of scientific research and agricultural development. As, as a result, we must need to do the following. Constitutionalization of youth engagement and consultation for the progression of this island. Promotion of a more self-sustaining, pioneering, and dynamic nation. Use the, fellow, the few countries who have gone before us as an example on what to do and what not to do. Tailor the industry to suit our country's desires and maximize benefit for all, more importantly, our youth and not just the wealthy, and to make a statement and show the entire world that a small nation can do big things too. As far as the blue and green economy, agriculture, and national food security ministry is concerned, the legalization of marijuana in itself without the appropriate structures and oversight would not prompt any economic growth or advantages. The real question is, what do we need to establish for the economic development of our youth as a result of the legalization of marijuana? No, you may, you'll be asking yourselves, what are, these, what are these implementations that will allow us to see the benefits of commercial marijuana for this 
purpose of this bit? Wait. For the... Sorry, let me rephrase. Now you may be asking yourself, what are these implementations that will allow us to see the benefits? Know that marijuana, medical marijuana, is hypothetically legal for this debate. I'll start by simply saying, everything comes with instructions. From chopsticks to radios, and even how to speak like the parliament, parliament, parliamentarian representative of the Portsmouth constituency in Douglas. How am I going to speak like this honorable member if I do not follow the proper procedures and protocols? Similarly, how will we, the youth, see any benefit from the legalization of commercial cannabis if we are not following the correct protocols and procedures? Therefore, in order to obtain optimal profit from this investment, a commission must be implemented to pass laws, amend legislation, control recreational activity, and instruct us on how to run this industry properly, Mr. Speaker. The commission under the auspices of foreign expertise and complying to the single convention on narcotic drugs treaty 1961, will pursue and impose policies and the standardization of the following. Large, sta large scale cultivation, indoor and outdoor horticulture and agriculture, labs and testing facilities, processing, manufacturing and handling, land and security, funding, dispensary and transportation, personnel training, and identification and credentialing. Secondly, they'll ensure the strict utilization of feminized seeds and medically accepted strains, allocate arable land to investors and administer the issuing of different types of licenses, such as cultivation licenses, retail licenses, manufacturing, processing and manufacturing licenses, transportation licenses, and research and development licenses. Similarly, to our sister country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and also Jamaica, a licensing class or tier system will be initiated to concede investors and more importantly, the youth's involvement in the industry and all that it has to offer. The classes or tiers, tiers of these li the licenses would be solely dependent on the acreage of land and the extent of the applicant's investment. <coughs> In November 2019, one year, one year after St. Vincent started its ca cannabis industry, an article reported by Eyewitness News stated that the St. Vincent and the Grenadines made $15 million from licensing and employed 300 direct employees under this industry. Furthermore, while the decriminalization of recreational cannabis still stands, through passing an Amnesty Act, and one similar to the traditional Cultivators Act in St. Vincent, illegal cultivators will now be able to obtain a license, join farmer cooperatives, and, pursue, and procure financial aid if necessary. All the produce, after being processed and analyzed, will be sold to the commission to prepare for exportation or local distribution, or local distribution to licensed and highly trained professionals. Having elucidated to all of this, there is really no need to reinvent the wheel. This has already been done, and it's just upon us to join one of the fastest growing industries worldwide, says the American Society for Testing and Materials. Based on an article published by the St. Vincent Times on the 19th of January, 2022, St. Vincent and the Grenadines have become the first OECS state to export medical cannabis to Europe. Why can't we be the second? Additionally, their Minister for Agriculture, Honorable Saboto Cesar, called out to the entire world to participate in this industry. And Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that it's about time we answer. With the Commission being established, with policies and standards being set, I can now address a critical economic issue. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Ashford, or Honorable Ashford Norris, ask a question. No, what must we ask ourselves? What, what, do you, what do the youth want? And I will tell you what the youth want. In preparation for today's debate, 
for, for, for today's debate, I put together a, new, a nation, nationwide survey and received a total of 85 responses from young people of various demographics and backgrounds. Out of the 85, a whopping 89.4% think that the implementation of a medical marijuana industry is a viable investment. 72.6% were interested in employment under this industry. Some even went as far as, as saying, save a job for me. Remember me when you call in people for jobs. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it is an irrefutable fact that the youth are more than interested in this burgeoning international industry. <laughs> and this industry isn't going to superintend itself. We must employ, we have to employ, we need employees, we need jobs to work this industry. It requires cultivators, land surveyors like my leader, Honorable Hanif Gregoire, chemical engineers, lab analysis, construction workers, entrusted individuals in charge of transportation and dispensing, licensing officials, marketers, manufacturers, electronic database managers, licensed marijuana doctors, and administrative persons in all of these aspects, especially in the commission. And also a command line of marijuana-based tetrahydrocannabinol, also commonly known as THC, or cannabidiol, CBD, oils, hair products, balms, shampoos, soaps, ointments, and other therapeutic items can be devised, providing more, providing more jobs with the Dominica Essential Oils and Spice Cooperatives, we already have decades of experience in the field of essential oils, which have a shelf life of two to five years. The production of marijuana oils could effectuate almost immediately. Additionally, licensed spas and pharmacies and therapists can utilize certain cannabis products and prescribe them to their patients. Our youth, the fruit of this nation, will be encouraged to become more involved in agricultural practices and educate, and educate themselves on, the mar on marijuana and its benefits, as it is a new industry and has plenty of room for innovation and is an auspicious inno innovative initiative. <laughs> they will also see it fit to seek foreign agricultural education, knowing they'll have a job or job opportunities in their local man marijuana industry, instead of using their knowledge for the advancement of a foreign economy. But for us to reap these benefits, we must physically sow the seeds. We, the youth, are going to need grounds and financing to cultivate marijuana. The aforementioned survey also indicated that 63% of the youth do not have access to land, or cultivatable land, for that matter. And a whopping 976 cannot meet the financial demands. Personally, it was quite obvious, even before doing the survey, that the youth would be limited in these aspects. However, strictly for the purpose of today's proceedings, in an, in an interview last Monday, the Honorable Prime Minister announced that he would uh, accept to give land and funding to the youth and farmers. <laughs> it was a joke, by the way, but I guess nobody got it. Uh, <laughs> But it was just so uncanny that the Honorable Prime Minister couldn't, could have, he couldn't have possibly announced this project at a more opportune moment. In case it was missed, last Monday, in an, in an interview alongside the Minister for the Blue and Green Economy, Agriculture and National Food Security, Honorable Fidel Grant, the Prime Minister announced the procurement of smart greenhouses and hydroponic systems and funding and land for agricultural processes for young and experienced farmers. Amidst the allocation of these necessities, what are we waiting for? With the prices of lower quality medicinal cannabis being 2.3 euros per gram in Germany, which is relatively cheap, cheap, set by the German Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, this equates to Eastern Caribbean dollars $3,113.39 per pound to, to the price of high quality medical cannabis going for American dollars, US dollars, $383.60 per 
per ounce or in Eastern Caribbean dollars, $16,587.17 per pound. Mr. Speaker, what is it that we're waiting for? Each plant under the ideal outdoor conditions will provide you with approximately 17.5 ounces of 500 grams, says a study by the Alaska State Legislature. It is, a, it is a high maintenance crop, but also a high yield crop, meaning that it has to be nurtured, almost like a child. But by using the triangular method and a four-foot center spacing, an acre will accommodate from end to end 2,603 plants, according to a study from Thailand's cannabis industry. There are also a variety of different techniques to cultivate cannabis and receive abundant yields. Along with that, different agricultural, different agricultural, I apologize. Honorable member, you have just about four minutes to complete your presentation. Thank you. Right. Along with that, different agricultural technologies and equipment will be introduced by foreign experts, can be used to acquire optimum yields and in the cultivation of other locally grown crops. Our nature isle, Dominica, home to rich volcanic soil, never-ending rivers, and a warm tropical climate, describes exactly what Mr. Pat Goggins, senior editor of Leafly.com and a former commercial cannabis cultivator says, that cannabis plants love and thrive in. The cultivation of our local strains will flourish better here, as they are already acclimatized and can be sold as intellectual property. This can help boost sales trajectory, breathe new life and foreign exchange into the agro-tourism agro sector, and invite foreign organizations who will be encouraged to invest and partner with our local farmers and entrepreneurs. International authorities were so quick to legalize and prohibit the use of this herb. We were given the opportunity with, without giving us the opportunity to discover its true potential. Something that was discovered by Van Calvez and his team at Green Mountain Composting Technologies is that marijuana is a leafy green and its fan leaves have a high nitrogen content. And with the addition of its stem, which, which would balance out the carbon to nitrogen ratio, it would become a very effective compost, which we could then use for other crops and or cannabis. The nitrogen could also be extracted to be used in a variety of ways from manufacturing fertilizers, nylon, dyes, explosives, nit nitric acid, and used to preserve food in pharmaceuticals, welding, electronics, and construction. Mr. Speaker, this plant is truly revolutionary and dynamic and will not just change the agricultural sector, but change the entire country. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the op opposition said that we want to become a dynamic nation, right? But in order for us to do that, or how can we want to become a dynamic Dominica and not utilize its dynamic crops? <laughs> yes, cannabis, a revolutionary plant, a distinguished medicine, but how is it affiliated with national food security and even the blue and green economy? Mr. Speaker, once again, uh, the Honorable Adicia Burton highlighted that cultivators will, or in cultivating medical marijuana, commercial marijuana, the supply of food will reduce and farmers will not no longer want to cultivate our traditionally grown crops. This could be the case if we did not use or follow the proper, proper cultivation procedures. 
Honorable member, you, you have just about one more minute to, to wrap up. Could I, could I ask for an additional five minutes, please? Motion for the member to have an additional five minutes. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the honorable member be given an extra five minutes to complete his presentation. Thank you very much. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Aye. The ayes have it. You may proceed. Thank you. Through certain cultivation methods or strategies, farmers will contribute to local food production while growing cannabis. This ag organic process will, will cause nitrogen levels and other nutrients in the soil to be revitalized and will subsequently harvest greater yields of cannabis and other crops. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Honorable Adicia Burton and um, her leader as well said that they will know they will be they will be using chemicals to put in our soils and put in our plants. But I can assure you that by using the aforementioned cultivation technique, that it will significantly reduce or negate the use of chemical enhancers and completely prevent chemical runoff into streams, rivers, protect aquatic life and other creatures. This cultivation method or technique is called crop rotation. Crop rotation, according to the Rodale Institute, is the practice of planting different crops sequentially on the same plot of land to improve soil health, optimize nutrients in the soil, and combat pest and weed um, pressures. Also, the government or commission can also mandate or at least incentivize intercropping. The, di the diverse use of crops on cultivation plots to maximize the farmland and prevent reduced cultivation of traditionally grown foods. Isn't that great? <laughs> Additionally, in order to keep production as green as possible, renewable energies such as solar power and geothermal can provide indoor cultivation facilities with electricity. Lastly, once the Amnesty Act has been passed, instead of going deep into our forests to secretly clear land and cultivate cannabis, disrupting animal habitats, causing soil erosion and polluting the rivers with soil and disrupting aquatic life, the farmers will cultivate cannabis more candidly. Mr. Speaker, I welcome the opportunity and consider it a great privilege and honor indeed to educate and enlighten members of the other side about the negative economic effects on the youth that may, cause, that may be caused by the legalization of marijuana. By the end of this debate, you, Mr. Speaker, as well as members of the other side, will be left with no choice but to appreciate and accept, <laughs> and accept that the massive negative impact of marijuana legalization on our youth and population will most certainly overweigh the minimal benefits that it may bring. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by making it fundamentally clear that legalization will lead to an increased marijuana use. Undoubtedly, will apply, this will apply to our young people as well. I am sure that those who are advancing the legalization agenda will find it absolutely difficult to improve this to prove to this honorable house how this huge increase marijuana usage is going to bring economic benefits to the individual young man, woman, or the nation as a whole. But although marijuana has not been legalized in Dominica, the negative impacts of marijuana use is evident among all youth. Mr. Speaker, the very simple question to those who support the marijuana legalization is, do you want to see this situation come from bad to worse? Or to ask the question in a different way, is increased marijuana going to enhance the mental and socioeconomic well-being of our young people? To you, Mr. Speaker, I would like those on the other side to listen attentively, be advised, and listen, and learn something which will help put them on the track of reforming and changing your position on the subject of legalizing marijuana. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
With legalization, young people will have less incentive to hide their habit of cannabis addiction. Already, among, already it is so annoying to see young people on the street corners or riding, puffing their lives away. Are they being productive or engaged in activities for personal development? I don't think so. Legalization will only make it worse, but will even make it more easy to suffer from the remaining stigmatizing, stigmatization and negative social consequences. Mr. Speaker, once one has been branded as a cannabis smoker, you suffer a negative, you suffer the stigma of being less productive, more prone to the workplace accidents, and higher absenteeism due to dependency. Marijuana use certainly impedes the employee's ability to receive managerial favors, pay raises, and promotions. This will, bring, this will have an effect on stoning the ability to move up the chain of responsibility and command. Mr. Speaker, members of this honorable house, there should be no doubt in our minds that the legalization will lead to an increased dependency and addiction among our youth Leading to, in, leading to increase and addiction among all youth and healthcare costs, including mental health. As with other drugs, marijuana dependency and addiction will lead to an increase. Honorable member, uh, I see another honorable member is on her feet. Um, are you standing on a point of order? Um, I'm going to ask you to, to, to have a seat and let her come forward. Yes, so we can hear you. Yes, I would just like to state that your team member, Odyssey Burton, already mentioned addiction, and you are repeating that same information. So I just wanted to raise that as a point of order. If we could carry on with your speech, but not repeat what was already mentioned by your other representative. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Honorable Member. Yeah, so just in general, please refrain from re repeating um, points that were made prior. All right, you may continue, Honorable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we should fear even more, that the legalization will leave each new smoker with the risk of processing heavy to other chronic, to chronic use. Obviously, new smokers would be young people. Mr. Speaker, research in other countries have proven that marijuana use among students lead to the reduction in the capacity to learn. Context as well. After all, the physical and mental effects of marijuana on humans are similar all over the world. Generally speaking, there is a positive correlation between one levels of education and the other socioeconomic status. The young person with the high level of education will most likely get a better paying job, have greater job security, have more opportunities for personal and professional development, a greater chance to move up the chain of responsibility and command. This means that he will be be in a better position to provide for the present and future needs of his family and create an even more stable, progressive community and nation. Mr. Speaker, can you imagine what would have happened if our beloved Waitukubuli, if most of our students were to become dependent or addicted to marijuana? This thought should further strengthen our resolve to do everything in our power to never let let such crucial befall fall on our lovely Dominica. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, health matters because health is wealth. I am certain that no, uh, nobody in, order, in the other side can deny the fact that the socioeconomic health of a nation 
to the large extent depends of the well, on the wealth and health, the health and wellness of the population. There is much evidence to show that marijuana use has short-term and long-term negative impact on the physical and mental health. This cannot be good for young people and the society at large. Mr. Speaker, members of this honorable house, let us briefly examine the issue of marijuana legalization more broadly. Mr. Speaker, we all accept the fact that data which is needed for a formal cost-benefit analysis of marijuana legalization is simply not available at this time. Data which shows young people on, in this country can benefit economically from the legalization of marijuana does not exist. Therefore, any attempt to use financial or economic rhetoric to advance or support the legalization of marijuana is not only highly impossible, but very deceitful. Trying to prove a point without data-driven evidence stifles transparency and can only lead to misdirect and misguided public debate. In other words, you will be only spreading propaganda without facts to support your argument. This can only result in useless talk, confusion, lack of proper understanding of the issue, and no meaningful resolution to the problem. As minister responsible for relation with the leaders of governments and heads of state all over the globe, one of my fears is that if marijuana is made legal, those who may not want to pay licenses, taxes, and other legal fees may create an underground cartel for the cultivation, distribution, <laughs> distribution and sale of cannabis. They may feel compelled to arm themselves to protect their investment, investments from law enforcement agencies and those who bold enough to try to steal from them or limit their activities. This will lead to increased crime and violence in Dominica. Additionally, we may be sanctioned by regional and international organization for illegal export of cannabis and illegal entry into their territories. This will place an additional burden on our regional security system and the nation's law enforcement authority. Mr. Speaker, it will require more resources to patrol our borders and has the potential to cause more, more, among, more tension among our neighbors in the, re in the region and hinder our, our OECS unity. Most certainly, such tensions will slow down the process of establishing the Caribbean single market and economy. The match to Caribbean integration will also be, will also be endangered. Finally, Mr. Speaker, members of this honorable house, what is more cynical and even more dangerous about those who support the view of the youth will benefit economically from the legalization of marijuana without any evidence to, pro to prove their point is that they are being extremely hypocritical and hiding from their real intentions. Um, Honorable Sanford, I, I see another honorable member has, has risen. Are you rising on a point of order? Okay. Yes. Honorable member, I believe you are imputing improper motive by calling us cynical and dangerous on the proposing team. Also, throughout your speech, you stated you are going to talk about the negative economic impact on the youth. You have yet to provide any data or statistics that state any negative economic impact on the youth. Thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Member, uh, I'm going to ask you to withdraw those um, statements relating to danger and so forth. And um, in, in terms of, of the data, 
um, yes, it's also very important that when, when debating matters of, of national importance such as these, you know, data is always very important to help strengthen your argument. So I'll just ask that you withdraw those statements and then you can continue. Okay, I withdraw. All right, noted. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of order, and I, I will beg for your guidance, of course. Last I checked, the Honorable House is guided through your guidance as well as also governed by the standing orders. Nowhere, as from my perusal, does it indicate that the proposing side should dictate to any member on the opposing side how exactly they decide to discuss the matter. They are not allowing the member. This is the second time that he has been interrupted and he has a, he has a presentation prepared. So I would just like to request from you what standing order exactly is being referenced to make or indicate to the member that he has to, to speak or phrase his particular presentation in the manner that the member is, is also presenting. And secondly, I would also like to caution members through you, Mr. Speaker, that all statements should be made through the Speaker of the House and not directly to members. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, just, just give me a, a moment. Yes, definitely. Honorable member, um, just to respond to Honorable Lander, um, using, I think he referred to members on the proposing side as their rhetoric being very dangerous and whatnot. So it, it, I consider that to be, you know, somewhat unparliamentary language. And for that reason, that is why it was asked to withdraw. So in, in terms of his line of debate, in general, I was saying that it is always good to have researched information and provide statistics. So I, I'm not ruling on, on that part of it merely giving a, a suggestion for moving forward. Yes, yeah, so you, you may proceed. Uh, and you have just about um, six minutes left, Honorable Member. That's enough. Mis Mr. Speaker, are companies which are making the millions of dollars in the tobacco and cigarette industry helping finance lung cancer research? The obvious answer is a big fat no. The problem is left on government agencies and responsible social partners to take care of. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the real intent to, is this to, prioritize, to privatize the profits and socialize the losses. The profits will be theirs while the problems will affect the entire society. Mr. Speaker, the net effect of this will make interest and of taxpayers subordinate to those, to those of the marijuana industry. Clearly, one can envision how dangerous it can be to our thriving democracy and way of life. It would be not fair for me to only blast the perceived minimal benefits of making marijuana legal without pointing out a safe and legal alternative to getting involved in the marijuana industry. Mr. Speaker, there are many other avenues available through which the youth of, Dominican gainfully, of Dominica gainfully engaged in, in, in employees or entrepreneurs have a higher standard of living and contribute to the enhancement of the nation. Hundreds of thousands of high-paying IT su support jobs are available all over the world. Technology affords us the ability to work and operate and direct businesses from our homes, eliminating the need for renting an office space. This means more money in our pockets. The fact is, because of their modern and up-to-date education and training, young people are best prepared to, make, to take up such positions. This will bring much needed foreign exchange and earnings to our Dominica. Recently, the government of Dominica launched, launched a plan to integrate agriculture, tourism, information technology with the aim of increasing the contribution of the agricultural sector to our gross domestic product. The primary target of this program is the youth on the island. Mr. Speaker, 
Here is a wonderful opportunity to get involved in cultivation, distribution, and sales of high-end agricultural produce to the niche markets and to make lots of money. Not only that, this will be providing the nation with fresh local produce. This will ensure better nutrition and health for all people and ensure increased foreign exchange earnings as well. So you see, Mr. Speaker, our young people can get involved in legal, socially acceptable livelihoods and through, make, and through this making meaningful and contrib a meaningful contribution Speaker. to nation building. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rise on a point of order, of clarification. Uh, Yes, you're, you're rising on a point of clarification. Yes, Honorable Member, you're rising on a point of clarification. Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member spoke of um, opportunities for the youth in digital technology and, and um, other agricultural opportunities. So, so what are you saying? So are we supposed, it's one or the other? Why not have more jobs? You have um, jobs in digital, digital technology. Honor, honorable member, I, I'm going to have to, to stop you there because it, it would seem that you are uh, rebutting his debate. So um, but, you, you can clarify a, a particular point, but you, you seem to be refuting what the, the honorable member is saying. So I, I just want to yeah, caution you against make, that, that trend make of it thought. clear what, what he was saying. You know, but anyways. Okay. All right. Thank you, honorable member. Yes, you may proceed. So, um, before you continue, just to let you know, um, Honorable Sanford, you have um, just about one minute to, to wind up your presentation. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. All right, it has been moved and seconded that the, the honorable member be given an additional two minutes to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. You, you may proceed. Mr. Speaker, with foresight, vision, and proper forward planning, our young citizens have the chance to make use of the present and future opportunities for economic and social advancement without the need to make this controlled substance, substance widely available to all. I have not even mentioned the opportunities that are available for the Dominica Youth Business Trust, the Youth Skills Training Program, and the Dominica State College. Mr. Speaker, honorable members of this house, because of all this information and knowledge that my colleagues and I have shared for in this parliament, it is in all good conscience that I can offer one shed of support to the motion before this house to secure a better future for the youth and the citizens. I must say an emphatic, an emphatic no to the legalization of marijuana on this our beautiful island. I hope that, the, that those on the other side will come to their senses and do the right thing by withdrawing this motion to help. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Aline, you're on your feet. I rise on a point of order. Um, Honorable Sanford, do I go to here? I can just speak to um, you. You can stay there. I can stay there? Yeah, it's All right. quick. Honorable Sanford um, said that we may be sanctioned for illegal exportation of, of cannabis, but by complying to the aforementioned treaty, the same... Um, Honorable Member, just um, remind me of the, the point of order on which you're on your feet. A point of clarification, my point, point of clarification. 
just, just once again to, to caution the honorable members, if you're asking for clarification, it's because you probably did not understand something or you want a, a, a definition. However, it is, is not advised to, to try to debate a particular point which was raised by uh, another member of this honorable house. Therefore, I shall sit down. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I recognize Honorable Amika Cognet. You may proceed. Um, Mr. Speaker, may I um, request the short podium, please, <laughs> so that I can do my presentation? In the meantime, let me introduce myself to the Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, I am Amika Cognet, the Honorable Youth Minister for the Ministry of Environment, Urban Renewal, and Kalinago Upliftment. And of course, I am representing the Leo Club of Dominica as the Vice President 2021-2022. Mr. Speaker and the Honorable House. Well, sorry, Mr. Speaker, I would like if you could permit me to reference my notes for the rest of my presentation. Yes, Honorable Member, that's not a problem. Sure. Thomas Jefferson once said, the greatest service that can be rendered to a country is to add a useful plant to its culture. On the 27th of October, 2020, our government passed an amendment to a bill to decriminalize the possession of 28 grams or one ounce or less of cannabis. The amendment also allows the cultivation of three cannabis plants at your place of residence. Historically, Mr. Speaker and the Honorable House, the cannabis plant was harvested for its fiber content for the use in the ship's rigging and business as usual. For instance, even the noose that they used to hang the men were made from cannabis, cannabis stems. Today, cannabis is used and cultivated for inter alia recreational, religious, medicinal, as well as industrial purposes, such as making paper and clothing. Cannabis was also known in prehistorical times for its thick, sticky resin, the Delta-1 tetra, tetrahydrocannabidol, or THC, as it is known, which produces psychoactive effects in humans. In more recent times, however, Honorable House and Mr. Speaker, scientific studies have shown that cannabis contains another useful chemical called cannabidol, also known as CBD. Biologically, all humans have these types of cannabinoid receptors in our body. Scientifically, it has been established that the CDB and the THC compounds in marijuana both have certain healing properties. For instance, when THC binds with receptors, mostly in the brain, it controls pain, mood, and certain other feelings. THC can make one feel euphoric and give you that so-called high, unlike CDB, which does not cause that high. Instead, CDB is thought to work with other elements in the body which are linked to feelings of well-being. It would be remiss of me, Mr. Speaker, to not have mentioned the negative effects of marijuana that marijuana has on the body, which has been scientifically proven. The debate on this matter, however, continues. Legislation doesn't automatically mean increased smoking. I would like to bring to the attention of this honorable house the benefits of marijuana to the Dominican environment, how marijuana through proper, 
Productive utilization can provide citizen empowerment to our people generally, especially our farmers, manufacturers, and our youth through innovative discovery and job creation. Primarily, to further discuss the points regarding the benefits of marijuana to Dominica, Mr. Speaker, let us define what environment is. And I quote, according to biologyonline.com, an environment is essentially the place over a particular time where organisms live or that which is occupied by a living thing, end quote. Let's, cons let's further consider the term, Mr. Speaker, urban renewal. Britannia.com states that urban renewal is the comprehensive scheme to redress a complex of urban problems, including unsanitary deficit or obsolete housing, inadequate transportation, sanitization, and other services and facilities, haphazard land use, traffic congestion, and the sociological correlates of urban decay, such as crime. Early efforts usually focused on housing reforms and sanitary and public health measures, followed by growing emphasis on slum clearance and the relocation of population and industry from congested areas to less crowded sites, just as the Garden City and Newtown's movement in Great Britain. Mr. Speaker, each country approaches urban renewal based on its means and its political administrative systems. One of the chief activities of urban renewal is the, rede the redevelopment, which is achieved through the clearance and rebuilding of structures that are deteriorated or obsolete in themselves or are laid out in an unsatisfactory way. Other aspects of urban renewal involve the reuse of the land for new purposes, rehabilitation of structurally sound buildings that have deteriorated or lost their original function and conservation, a protective process designed to maintain the function and quality of an area, for instance, by requiring or assisting adequate maintenance while preventing inappropriate development or uncharacteristic changes in the use of land and buildings. As such, Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that we ensure that policies are put in place to proper usage of our environment, urban city enhancements, and to provide opportunities to particularly our Kalinago community and in Dominica in general. A couple days ago, on Monday the 21st of March 2022, Dominica joined the world in celebrating the International Day of Forests under the theme, Forests and Sustainable Production and Consumption. A timely reminder of the importance of the sustainable use of our forests. Dominica can boast not only about the fact that it has in excess of 60% vegetation cover, but also the country with perhaps the greatest percentage of protected area of 21% in our hemisphere, and last but by no means least, a forest ecosystem which has proven itself to both relevant and resilient bearing in mind ravages caused by Hurricane David some 43 years ago, and more recently, Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria in 2015 and 2017, respectively. On all occasions, as with other similar natural disasters, the forests have re-emerged in a rather quick time. In addition to their extractive uses, our forests and ecosystems here in Dominica provide a number of critical ecosystem services that support non-extractive functions, including watershed protection, soil protection, and erosion control. Disaster reduction, carbon sequestration, and climate regulation. The supply of water for domestic, industrial, agricultural, and recreational uses is another especially important services provided by our forests and our environment that we live in, in Dominica. Here, 
Forests are mainly being utilized for a variety of reasons, including tourism development, watershed protection, wildlife conservation, charcoal and lumber production, and non-timber products, and mitigating against climate change and others. Mr. Speaker, and our honorable members of this house, marijuana production will be of a non-timber species. If pursued, if pursued, Mr. Speaker, it will provide the country with not only another crop, but with one with valuable economic benefits, which will boost our gross domestic product significantly. Our, cl our, clima our climatological, or rather our climate and conditions here will no doubt be an advantage. Added benefits, added benefits could be cost factors as well as our abundant sunshine for drying and the energy and our natural air and soil nutrients. Moreover, the cost in maintaining these mar the cost in maintaining marijuana farms will be significantly lower as we will be using natural processes. Mr. Speaker, natural processes. The opposing side has mentioned all the fertilizer and greenhouses, etc. But we will be using natural processes, natural sun and air dried instead of commercial dryers, which will extract massive amounts of energy. The soil is naturally rich in nutrients that are needed for such crop production. And due to us wanting to maintain an organic crop and product outcome, the use of artifi artificial fertilizers will not be used. No need to worry, Mr. Speaker, members of the opposing side and other members of this house. No need to worry about our birds, our animals getting high as cannabis is a natural insect repellent. This also means that pesticides would be really needed to conserve these cannabis farms. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I submit that marijuana cultivation here will have a minimal negative impact on our country's ecology. The opposition minister, Adisa Burton, stated before in her speech about the deforestation that will happen during the cultivation of um, the cultivation of marijuana farms. But, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, may I address <laughs> the Honorable Adisa Burton with a short point to tell her why this will not be. No, just a reminder, you, you have to be speaking to the chair. Oh, so I speak to you. That's okay. right. All right, so no problem. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Speaker, to address that point that she stated, marijuana has proven to grow wildly and freely in the Commonwealth of Dominica and at almost any elevation in Dominica due to the deforestation seen as a result of Hurricane Maria on September 17th, 2020, the four, September 17th, 2019, sorry, 27, 2017, sorry, the Forestry, Wildlife and Parks Division has been feverishly, feverishly working to reforest our island with fruits and land stabilization crops over the past few years through numerous reforestation programs. Therefore, I propose that we use these marijuana farms in already existing areas that require reforestation. That will then, then we will not have to cut down mass forests to cultivate the herb. <laughs> Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to further submit that marijuana can provide citizen empowerment by contributing to the lowering of the crime rate and also for job creation since the employed will have a disposable income. Our youths will become more empowered and the manufacturing sector here can be boosted as a result. According to cult a culture writer, Shamara Lawrence, in her article published on April 20th, 
2018 on teenvogue.com. Marijuana legalization can't erase decades of disenfranchisement and incarceration. It is time for lawmakers to advocate for comprehensive laws and new community programs to remedy the effects legislation has had on the livelihoods and well-being of people of color. Mr. Speaker, we are people of color. Here in Dominica, we have also disenfranchised our youth in similar ways. As the Honorable Minister who spoke just before me stated all the ways that our youth have been, or rather the ways that our youth will use the drug in the, or use marijuana in a bad way, they have been chastised. Mr. Speaker, our youth have been chastised. Chastised by the legal system in the past for their usage and distribution of cannabis. However, though they were doing it illegally before, now that the legislation allows for the use of carrying of marijuana with 28 grams with more openness on the matter through debates such as this and education on the subject, a more positive and profitable outcome can be realized nationally. I believe more openness should be approached Let's use these young people's expertise as a springboard to properly train them using their already acquired knowledge and turning it into a positive outcome for them. Mr. Speaker, according to the Honorable Lakia Joseph, leader of the opposing side, people tend to do the opposite of what they are told. Mr. Speaker, the youth need to be enfranchised. Engage them in something that they already have the basic know-how to do. And use this opportunity to build on their skills through the hiring of these individuals. I believe that would allow them to earn a decent income of which, of, of, which, of course, Mr. Speaker, can be taxed for the greater good of all Dominicans. In addition, it would be adversely, it would be adversely low, it would adversely, sorry, lower the crime rate significantly. Mr. Speaker and honorable members of the House, as my colleague, Mr. Etienne stated earlier. Honorable Etienne. Oh, honorable Etienne, sorry, stated earlier, if before it was decriminalized. We will not have young persons being in situations where their reputations are defamed. Or, for instance, that they feel they cannot get a job because they were once using marijuana. Therefore, I propose that we channel the energy and talent of our young people productivity productively by pursuing the development of cannabis farms under governmental and nationally directed conditions as stated by my colleague, Honorable Michael Allen. Similarly, I see- Honorable member, um, you have just about two minutes remaining. Mr. Speaker, I need <laughs> additional time. That, that has to be put by the House. Has to be moved I, by the House. I would like to move that the member receives additional five more minutes to continue or complete our presentation. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that the Honorable Member be given an additional five minutes to complete her presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The eyes have it. You may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members of the House. Similarly, I see employment being created within the Kalinago territory for our young Kalinagos through the same medium. 
However, the advantage is that the Kalinago territory already has a herbal tour and there is significant economic benefits if cannabis is at cannabis and its uses can be explained through their already existing system. In addition, they have rich soil to cultivate massive cannabis farms. Since this is a community which has traditional farming practices, we can guarantee an authentic brand which will be strictly organic. These farms will have many jobs available, hence creating employment for our Kalinago people and the surrounding communities. With time, it is hoped that similar farms can be set up at other strategic areas on island to ensure that we can empower as much citizens as possible, especially our young people. More so, Mr. Speaker, the young men. Not singling out the women, but most of our young men, when asked, they tend to be interested in cannabis production and doing manual labor. Mr. Speaker, we must not seek to legalize it, cannabis. We must seek to legalize them, the youth. To summarize a quote from the Honorable, to summarize a quote from the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Roosevelt Skerritt, a couple weeks ago at the youth parliament training session held at the Kempinski Resort and Spa. The current global demand and growing industry in marijuana and the removal of restrictions and various levels of legislation or approvals for limited use for medical, medicinal purposes can all contribute to the surpluses of that of the Yes, honorable, honorable member, are you standing on a point of order? No, Mr. Speaker, I'm standing on a point of clarification. Okay. Um, the honorable member on the other side, what did she say? Um, legalize the youth? Was that, was, was that what you um, said? Let, let me um, correct uh, an issue that I, I may have brought forward. Um, as it pertains to a point of clarification, it is, is when a member says something that in his contribution, which has been misinterpreted by another member during the other member's presentation. So somebody said something in your presentation is misinterpreted, then you can stand on a point of clarification to correct that misinterpretation. Only if the the speaker the speaking member yields to the other person so if not you would have to wait until the end of that person's presentation to make that point of clarification so what so in this case mr speaker what is it so i would say let the honorable member continue for presentation noted mr speaker thank you thank you mr speaker To summarize a quote from the Honorable Prime Minister Dr. Roosevelt Skerritt a couple weeks ago at the Youth Parliament training session held at the Kempinski Resort and Spa, the current global demand and growing industry in, in marijuana and the removal of restrictions and various levels of legislation or approvals for limited use for medicinal purposes can all contribute to the surpluses and for the development for the development of cannabis, of the cannabis industry here. The Honorable Minister stated, Dominica would be foolish to ignore the global trends, especially given our nutrient-rich soils, the availability of water in our rivers, and what appears to be the ideal conditions for a unique brand and a high-value crop, end quote. As cited in the Drugs Prevention of Misuse Amendment Act 2020, subsection 7b2, it is an offense for persons to smoke or use cannabis or cannabis resin in a public place. Public intoxication is both illegal and undesirable, Mr. Speaker. Marijuana, whilst it causes what amounts to public intoxication behavior, Mr. Speaker, we no doubt have to allow we no doubt have to allow for the vicissitudes of life. We drink on the road, Mr. Speaker, during carnival. So when should we consume our marijuana? When should marijuana be consumed here? And though the opposing side may submit that smoking in public is bad and mention the issues of secondhand smoke and that cannabis is an antidepressant so it may slow you down or calm you too much, through public and personal education, much knowledge on the subject can be achieved. I say, Mr. Speaker, 
we must learn to contain our calmness and come up with practical solutions to our legalizing and job security for young people. Mrs. Well, now, really, may have one more minute okay. to, to wrap up your presentation. Mr. Speaker, similar to the red light district, I propose that we bend our old ne and negative connotations and turn it into a positive message focusing on a productive and sustainable lifestyle and create a green light district where all marijuana products will be sold. I propose, Mr. Speaker, that we reuse our historical buildings that are not being used right now and contain our marijuana district, green light district, to the Barracoon building in Roseau. It is close to the ports. It is right next to Dexia, where they are already giving farmers and um, entrepreneurs the right to sell marijuana products within the market space, right located right there. Just imagine something like a puck fest and everything there is marijuana, from the tea, from the juices, from the meals that are served. Mr. Speaker, all around the world, a lot of products are being produced and therefore it gives us and our youth entrepreneur, entrepreneurship rights in order to provide us with products that are made from marijuana, hence creating employment. Thank you. Yes, I recognize Honorable Annika Andrew. Um, before you, you, you commence your presentation. Um, yes, I'm just going to ask you to turn off your mic. Okay, so you, you may begin. Mr. Speaker, I, Annika Andrew, rise to contribute the following points towards this debate on behalf of my shadow ministry of governance, public service reform, citizen empowerment, social justice, and ecclesiastical affairs. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, may I refer to my notes while I deliver my contribution? Yes, you may. Please proceed. Mr. Speaker, any legislation that targets economic development as a primary objective must be dealt with with utmost care. Our community is composed of a wide variety of people who hold different traditions, beliefs, and norms. Constructing a legislation that will benefit each member of various communities, Mr. Speaker, needs to be clear and operated to the highest standard achievable. Our efforts must be collaborative, Mr. Speaker, while education for the youth and standards must be a primary focus, Mr. Speaker. While no one doubts the benefits of the international hub, Mr. Speaker, I am not fully convinced that the opinion of the, medic the medical practitioners especially those in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Indeed, the social and behavioral scientists were sourced before the impute of parliament. Mr. Speaker, taken from an American Addiction Center article, which says that there are different chemical compounds in marijuana which are known to have harmful effects even in its natural un uncontaminated form. Marijuana can damage the brain of some young people, even with minimal usage, Mr. Speaker. Research is required to determine the facts about the usage of marijuana and the possible causes it has on our nation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a reference taken from zamzia.com. This is a website that provides education and products on how to grow cannabis. 15 minutes scanning this website would highlight how sophisticated 
growing marijuana can be to get the best results. From seed to harvest, the products and varieties available are vast. There needs to be an organized effort on our part to ensure we are successful, Mr. Speaker. Our organic soil puts us at a distinct advantage in our ability to produce a high quality product. It is only practical that we develop and operate this program in a way that can match the product we are capable of producing. Mr. Speaker, we can't ignore the fact that legalizing marijuana increases the availability of the drug, diminishes the perception of harm related to its use, and increases acceptability of its use. Mr. Speaker, I'm a realist, and I don't wish to be considered a politician here, especially on this weed issue. What is my reality, Mr. Speaker? I see the continuous open daily abuse of marijuana by the masses, especially the youth, including young women. Our body are likened to a chemical compound, and hence it reacts to the intake of substances, substances sorry, differently. One man's honey might be another man's poison, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Understanding trends in marijuana use among the youth is an essential step towards developing healthy policy, adequate education, and targeted interventions to mitigate potential adverse health and social effects of marijuana. There must be a drastic reform of current social support structures available to the youth. The Drug Prevention Unit needs to be given a significant increase in support and manpower. And the construction of a rehabilitation center can be a support system that the unit uses on a daily basis. And it could also provide a solution for juvenile cases. The Skills Training Division and the National Employment Program can be synchronized to create an education internship in collaboration that will take individuals from classroom to career before age 20. Development of these institutions as collaborative partners will lead to the development and reform of people involved in the program and community at large, paving the way to success, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, isn't this dynamic Dominica a slogan that has been coined to describe the Dominica we hope the youth will inherit? It may not have been our idea, but the relaunching of Destination Dominica and direct flights from the US are steps that are improving Dominica's status on the world stage. Say it good, Mr. Speaker. The next step to relaunching our brand should be to relaunch our ambitions. Mr. Speaker, the attention of the modern young people has, begun, has been captured by social media. Platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, they are the most common sources of information retrieval for the average person under 25. Mr. Speaker, it can be used to our advantage to disseminate information and educate our young people, not only about the program, but other educational programs as well. We no longer wish to hope that our plans are successful. Instead, we should mentor 
and guide success. <laughs> Participants of the program should not simply be given a job, but supported throughout their career until they are able to contribute or compare to other programs internationally. In other words, Mr. Speaker, we do not just want them to be as good as everyone else. We want them to be the best because we are the nature isle. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, permit me to read scripture text taken from the New International Version Bible, Matthew 19, verse 14. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The youth are the leaders of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, and it is our job to guide and protect them, teach and impress upon them the values of life. Data is important, Mr. Speaker, since it helps guide the formation of policy. There is no evidence that any social survey was conducted among the youth population to determine the factual and actual event, extent, sorry, of their views on legalization. The burns of the consequences of this fall squarely upon the laps of the youth. They are the major stakeholders, Mr. Speaker. I don't have reason to believe that we have any local scientific study on this issue in Dominica. I would have thought it prudent to do so before considering legislation. As a nation, Mr. Speaker, we have a poor track record of documented, gazetted public study. Again, Mr. Speaker, a shift in mind shift and operation will be needed for success. This is a youth we are highlighting here, Mr. Speaker. The young people that will be sitting in these seats in a few years to come, leading organizations and institutions, and ultimately will be responsible for safe transferring of the future in the generation after to come. We ought to pay close attention to what we believe will be beneficial to them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this intended legislation brings back the past and how it will affect our young people in society. For example, I attended a particular primary school where the anti-drug program was it, there. There, marijuana was discriminated against. Furthermore, there created impact in a number of young people's lives. Even today, there has a curriculum which is focused on providing students with knowledge, skills, and tools to make decisions for safe and healthy living and then avoidance of high-risk behaviors. And there is strongly opposing marijuana up till today, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we have the Drug Prevention Unit, and this organization should play an integral part in addressing the youth in a way that they are able to understand the whole structure, implementation, legalization of marijuana, the plans or proposal of the government. How would you feel, Mr. Speaker, if you were charged for less than a pound of marijuana and you now work as part of the marijuana industry as one of the primary planters? Are we playing chess in this system, Mr. Speaker? Who has the crown, Mr. Speaker? Who is huffing, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, it would be naive not to have anticipated an astronomical increase in marijuana usage after a decriminalization, and therefore put a rehabilitation mechanism in place to deal with the eventuality. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Joseph made mention of CBD, THC, presented all the benefits of CBD, differentiated between CBD and THC. THC is the issue at hand, Mr. Speaker. This is why we stand for structured program, one that is well designed and defined. And this shadow ministry that I carry, Mr. Speaker, I believe has to play an integral part if we want to shape the lives of the young people. Mr. Speaker, 
We claim to be a resilient nation. Survey shows hemp is one of the most resilient resources available to man. I'm surprised that none of my um, proposing opponents didn't mention. This can be used to make a variety of commercial and industrial products like rope, clothing, shoes, natural energy, etc. The employment opportunities for the youth are endless. Jobs can be created in agriculture, agro-processing, sales, distribution, marketing, human resource management, engineering, equipment maintenance, repair, and modification, to name a few. Each product can create jobs for each category stated above. Hemp grows in a wide variety of climates and soil types. The biggest advantages for farmers could be that it grows rapidly and chokes out competing strains. But Mr. Speaker, are we prepared for failures? Hemp is another uncommon agricultural product that might have marketing challenges. Since most of our young people want export to take its course, financial risk is a common risk in agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Financial risk can be presented due to higher than expected expenses, lower yields, lower market prices, or poorer quality, all of which reduces cash flow and profitability. What about legal risk, Mr. Speaker? Legal risk can also occur in agriculture. This on the hemp topic, Mr. Um, Speaker. This may take the form of nuisance lawsuit, lack of permits, accidents, or any other occurrences that puts one in a position for dealing with the legal system. Mr. Speaker, I ponder on the government's step-by-step -step process in legalizing marijuana. A nature isle filled with riches, intelligent men and women who can dialogue with this administration. Mr. Speaker, what principles and management procedures are there to tackle this marijuana industry that is real? One must take a country's governance with pride and honor, Mr. Speaker. That, Mr. Speaker, let us recognize the elements of government, of governance, sorry. Here, if we want this industry to strive and that the objective of my opponents can be fulfilled. We have ethics, risk management, compliance, and administration, Mr. Speaker. How can this law be implemented that allows for the average person to benefit directly? As a public project, efforts should be made to ensure a diverse mixture of the electorate. The potential dangers to our society is immense, my, open, my opponents. There must be a concerted effort to have dialogues and education with the people to gain the best results for us all. What tone are we setting? Is this just an idea, Mr. Speaker? Is this something else that will bear little fruit? Or will it be a national landmark in the history of the nation? An event so massive and wide-reaching, it changes the cost of the economy of the nation. This is a bill, Mr. Speaker, that needs follow-up, active administrative support, and a flexible management team who can adapt to the on demands and needs of customers, both internal and external. It should be noted that some individuals who have planted illegally to supply in times past, if these individuals can find a benefit in legit business, they will surely find another way, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I compare Nature Isle Dominica and Sister Isle St. Vincent with the data given from credible source, noma.com, dataworldbank.com. Our agricultural land mass is 250 square, square kilometers, while St. Vincent is 70 square kilometers. Where, where is St. Vincent on their vision, Mr. Speaker? 
For years, they have been developing cannabis, the cannabis industry. In 2018, St. Vincent created a state agency to overcome Honorable member, uh, you have just about three minutes left to conclude your presentation. In 2018, St. Vincent created a state agency to oversee licensing and to ensure its medical cannabis is available to local patients and much more. Did, did you know that they are on the brink of becoming a globally leading producer of organically certified medical cannabis? Wow, Mr. Speaker. Where are we? We walk around boasting that Dominica soil is the best, the water is the best, Mr. Speaker. But we sit on our visions. Years accumulate, Mr. Speaker, before we make decisions in the best interests of our young people. Let us not make this continued norm, Mr. Speaker. Let us work together hand in hand, ensuring that we set up the necessary framework policies. Mr. Speaker, as I end, let me tell my opponents that the youth would expect this administration to cross the T's and dot the I's. Mr. Speaker, as I commence the closing remarks for this argument, I would just like to show the Honorable Host this Bible that I have compiled based on the fallacies that you can find in my opponent's arguments. Mr. Speaker, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but no promises. I will start firstly with the speeches of, I'll go in the chron chronological order as the opposing team, the honorable members, went. Mr. Speaker, I'll start with the honorable Adisha Burton in her speech. I found a lot of reference made to social ills, mental illnesses, psychosomatic disorders, all these things. And while, Mr. Speaker, I found it very difficult to correlate the evidence which they found with the statements that they were making, I would like to quote uh, a, report, a research paper which states, which states that marijuana use is safer than the use of alcohol. There is no medically reported marijuana overdose death. There are about 25,000 alcohol deaths per year in the U.S., according to a report by Nico, Nicola Kovic entitled Economic Benefits of Marijuana Legalization. Mr. Speaker, another thing that I saw happened a lot with the opposing team is that whenever they refer to the psychosomatic or these mental illnesses when it comes to marijuana, they usually just mention it and then couple it to something else. Allow me to page through my Bible to get the reference, Mr. Speaker. And it happened on two occasions, or probably even more, but, but that was the among that I was able to capture. Even in the presentation of Mr. Sanford, he spoke about it, and then he went on spoke about the addiction, but didn't give much substantial evidence to back up the claim. The Honorable Arm Member Maxime, he quickly spoke about the marijuana, you can get addicted to it, the, 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 the properties that, are, that comes with marijuana, but then he quickly coupled it with the economic benefits. With, and he didn't necessarily give any backing, any surveys, any claims, any evidence to substantiate whatever he was saying. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member spoke a lot about the marijuana industry. Can Dominica really supply demand? And this was a point that I took from the Honorable Burton's speech. Can Dominica really supply demand when it comes to our, our economic scale, our mass? And she also spoke about the fallout. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, in the recent speech that happened with the Honorable Andrew, she just told us that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, while they are pushing, and she even commended them on how well they are doing with marijuana legalization and the medical export of cannabis, she told us that Dominica is way larger than St. Vincent. So how does one of the speakers tell us that we're not able to supply demand based on our land scale or forestry and so forth, but then the other member comes to tell us that, well, we are larger, St. Vincent is smaller, they're doing it, but we can't. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. Speaker? Also, Mr. Speaker, I would just like to touch on the Honorable Andrew's speech. I, I just want to say that I know she said that she, she doesn't want to think of herself as a politician, but you're a good speaker. You are. But I found it difficult to find more than, let's say, five sources from a 20-minute speech. I found it difficult to, to really substantiate a lot of the claims that she was making reference to. Mr. Speaker, even in the training sessions that we had as youth parliamentarians, the, 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 the presenters told us about different types of speeches, motivational speeches. And I can tell you if this was a high school graduation, I would be moved. But Mr. Speaker, this is parliament. We need to bring the facts. You need to show us what is possible. Also, Mr. Speaker, I'm coming to that. Also, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Andrew spoke about <laughs> hemp, and she said that she found it very difficult, dumbfounding that the proposition did not mention hemp. But Mr. Speaker, in my presentation, when I spoke about Dr. Jimmy's, I did mention that hemp was one of the main things in, in his products. And to read, to read the, the, the quote, I say, to stand out in what was important, and I quote, to stand out it was important that Dr. Jimmy's first focus, on, first focus was on providing unique, purpose-driven hemp products that support healthy, healthy recreational living. And I, I'm not going to go deep in, into, the, into the, 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 the quote, but I just want to make reference to that being a logical fallacy that the speaker stated that we didn't mention it when it was actually stipulated. Mr. Speaker... I want to go on to the points where the honorable members, especially the, 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 the honorable member Stanford, he said, he spoke about tobacco and narcotic companies. And he, he made an absolute, and this is another log logical fallacy, where he said, he stated that the, there, were no, there was no funding to go back into rehabilitation centers or even research when it comes to, when it comes to non-communicable communicable diseases as a result of the smoking of marijuana. Mr. Speaker, I shall ask. Where was the facts? Where was the evidence? What study did he quote to show that there were no companies, and I know based on companies, I'm not even going to mention it, but companies that have the corporate social responsibility, we can just start there, Mr. Speaker. And then going a little further into the Honorable Stanford debate where he spoke about the reputation that precedes people who smoke. Mr. Speaker, I really don't want to promote discrimination and stereotypes within the Honorable House of Parliament. What someone does with their personal life, once it doesn't hurt them, it doesn't hurt the community, it doesn't hurt the country, is none of our business. Mr. Speaker, he also made reference to, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask you to tell the Honorable Firelander to keep it down a bit, he's distracting. Or well, I want to please allow the, the member who's on his feet to, to make his presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Speaker. Also, Mr. Speaker, he spoke about what he referred to as a marijuana smoker. Mr. Speaker, I really don't know what a definition of a marijuana smoker is than someone who smokes marijuana. But if you see someone smoking marijuana on the street, on the side of the road, it doesn't mean that, you know, the fancy lady in the office that you went to for an interview, she, do, she doesn't smoke marijuana either. It doesn't mean that. Marijuana consumption is for everyone. And now with the decriminalization of 20 grams, 28 grams, sorry, marijuana is everybody's business today. So, Mr. Speaker, can I, 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 
I wish the honorable member could have just provided a little more clarification on that. But I mean, as we're pressed for time, I'm, I'm not really in the mood to hear any more logical fallacies. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would really like to address some of the items in the Honorable Jose Maximez um, presentation, but to be very honest, I'm a very brilliant person, but not even I could really synthesize what was being said. However, some of the points that I made um, relates, and I only make mention to it because it's clear to see that this, the opposition ne didn't necessarily have a strategy in mind. Their points directly counteracted each other. The Honorable Adicia Burton stated that we are not necessarily, and I'm just paraphrasing here, Mr. Speaker, we're not necessarily capable to supply demand, especially when the industry falls out. The burden falls on the people, the farmers, the people in the, involved in the industry. However, Mr. Maxim has said in his speech that Mr. Speaker, he spoke about modest cannabis production. That is possible here in Dominica. I am not too much of an English person myself, but I think modest kind of sums it up in itself. Mr. Speaker, another thing I saw in relation to the Honorable Jose Maximez speech, I mean the psychological norm, I have it in, on all the pages for all the speakers when it comes to the psychological effects, the psychosomatic. I'm not even going to spend much time on it because, like I said, we want to see the facts. Show us the car facts. Mr. Speaker, because it's true, Honorable Member, we need to see the facts. When it comes to the miseducation, he spoke on miseducation as it relates to marijuana, then he, went, then he spoke about the quantities. Mr. Speaker, I must admit that our Minister for National Security made a, a, a little, just a small mistake in his speech when he spoke about the, the, the behavior of opposition. I'm on the floor and I believe that I deserve the respect that I am due on the floor. Yes, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to education, and this is something that I wasn't aware of, and if, if it wasn't for this debate, I still wouldn't have been aware of it. If you put a case study in front of everyone here, not even the average Dominican, the parliamentarians, and you put different quantities of marijuana in front of them, can someone tell me what is 28 grams? Can you watch it and say that that is 28 grams? So at the end of the day, I don't blame the Minister for National Security when he was at fault and he said that, because in my experience, I've seen some very big joints that definitely have more than 28 grams. And lastly, Mr. Speaker, I, re I really don't want to take too much time. I will just go on the benefits of the cannabis industry and its, it, the, 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 the economic benefits that it can have. Mr. Speaker, and I'm bringing it into context of our Caribbean region because I'm the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I mean, I will, as much as I want to, I will try to contextualize and localize information, but I'm in the international scene all the time. I travel all the time, Mr. Speaker, and when I see something happening, I bring it back to my country and I tell them what is possible. So as it relates to the net worth of the cannabis industry, I'll just state this from a speech that I mentioned earlier today. The cannabis industry is a billion dollar industry. Based on an article on relocateantigua.com, it stated, estimated to be a whopping 150 billion globally, the medical cannabis industry is not to be sniffed at. In the Caribbean, Jamaica has emerged as a forerunner in a medical legalization game with the Jamaican Cannabis Legal Licensing Authority estimated trade between medical licenses at over 100 million in 2019 alone. Honorable Member, you have less than one minute to wrap up. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll just finish the quote which states that an article, no, Mr. Landa, I don't think I've sufficiently made my point. An article on marijuanaprocon.org stated that the marijuana industry, adult and medical in the United States, could exceed 24 billion in revenue by 2025. Mr. Speaker, the market is ready. The international scene is ready. Our Caribbean scene, we are ready. And as it relates to our preparation and whether or not we're ready in the Caribbean, it is us as the youth to tell the governments what we want to do with it. Do we want a sector? Do we want there to be an organization where this, the, the, the proceeds that we get from marijuana, the, the, the 
Mr. Speaker, I believe I, I Mr. Speaker, I would like to invite a motion to give me an extra five minutes. I was trying to be as nice as I could in order to facilitate the time. I was trying to be as nice as I could to facilitate the time because it is late, Mr. Speaker, and we're busy people. So I'd like to invite a motion for extra five minutes um, for me to wrap up my presentation properly. Mm -hmm. Motion for two minutes for our member here from the Rosa North constituency. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the honorable member be given an additional two minutes to wind up his presentation. Um, just to respond to that, um, Honorable Lander, <laughs> the, the, the Member of Parliament who is on his feet commenced his wind-up at 4.57. It is now 5.10, so he has been speaking for 13 minutes. No, I, I, I believe you are, are mixing matters. When, when a member is on his feet presenting, he is allocated a specific amount of time. Whether or not in the debate that members are given additional time, that is not in, in relation to the member who is on his feet speaking at this moment. So, Honorable um, Norris, I, I, you have about one more minute just to wrap up, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd just like to make the point that the opposing team was rather very distracting and really don't appreciate this display in this honorable house. I believe we should be held at the highest standards of ethics in this land. Mr. Speaker, I'll just say this. As it relates to this plant, this commodity, this herb, I believe that we should be guided by the, the principles of our foreign policy and philosophy, which lies in liberalism and in regional integration. Mr. Speaker, the marijuana industry, it is constantly evolving, it is growing, and it is dynamic. And I don't see that there are any other stakeholders or any other contingency that is better able to handle it than the young people who are innovative, creative, and more than ready and able to take it on. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. This concludes the debate on the motion. I will now put the question. Be it resolved that the government legalizes marijuana as it can provide economic benefits, particularly to the youth. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The motion has been approved. Mr. Speaker, whereas the COVID-19 pandemic is the defining global health crisis of our time and the greatest challenge we have faced since World War II, and whereas since the first case of COVID-19 reported in Dominica in March 2020, the country has recorded 11,724 confirmed cases and 62 COVID-related deaths as a result of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and whereas Dominica has administered at least 62,110 doses of COVID-19 vaccine so far, and whereas beyond the health crisis, COVID-19 has created devastating social, economical, 
and political crises that will, de that will leave deep scars. And whereas COVID-19 vaccines available in Dominica are effective at protecting people from getting seriously ill, being hospitalized, and even dying, therefore, be it resolved that the COVID-19 vaccines be made mandatory for all citizens. I beg to second the motion. At this point, I'd like to call the, the, the proposal of the, the motion to, to open the debate. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my full support to the motion before the House. Prior to my commencement of my contribution, Mr. Speaker, I am a homeboy. Therefore, I would like to send warm greetings to my grandmother, Timadam, my mother, Rowan, my aunt, Nara, my Rock Garden family, and my colleagues at the Casabros Secondary School. It is because of your invaluable contributions that I can stand and present in this most honorable house. Mr. Speaker, on January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the SARS-CoV-2 virus a public health emergency of national concern and a pandemic on March 11, 2020. Society as we knew it was completely shifted. Mr. Speaker and members of this honorable house, do we remember that moment? Do we really recall what happened last year, March? The fear, the anxiety. People were trembling. If you had coughed too hard by somebody, they were shaking. Do we remember that? I am not sure for you all, but I most certainly remember 2020. Looking at the news and seeing the ravages of this horrible disease. This disease manifested in countries such as Italy, the UK, and what was once considered the epicenter of the disease, New York City. World leaders scrambled and pleaded for solutions to curb in this most deadly problem. Trillions of dollars globally were spent on COVID relief, trying to make life somewhat livable for the citizen, citizenry of the various nations. Mr. Speaker, we saw the closure of schools, places of worship, recreational spaces, private and public entities. Life as we knew it halted, and many people sought a solution to these heart-wrenching and depressing conditions. Mr. Speaker, I am here today to present to you, the honorable members of this house, and the wider members of the listening public, the much-needed solution. This, Mr. Speaker, is the vaccine. That's right. Coupled with the standing physical distancing and health protocols, Mr. Speaker, we need the jab. The notion of mandating vaccines has been at the forefront of global discussion from the highest courts of the land down to the most simple places like barbershops, hair saloons, bars, after church services. Mr. Speaker, one may ask themselves, why vaccines? What does a vaccine do? Why is this the ultimate solution? According to an article published by the World Health Organization, and Mr. Speaker, with your leave, put me to quote, on December 8th, 2020, a vaccine contains the weakened parts of a particular organism called an antigen. This antigen triggers an immune response equipping the body to fight any future infections. Therefore, the theory that vaccines infect you with the disease itself is immediately debunked. Mr. Speaker, we need the jab. Mr. Speaker, vaccines are not a modern day scientific revelation. The efficacy of vaccines have been proved, tried, and tested across the different spheres of the globe. 
Mr. Speaker, do we recall or have we ever heard of diseases such as polio, measles, rubella? These diseases ravaged the world in the 1900s, leaving millions out of work, severely ill, and dead. Mr. Speaker, permit me to read out some statistics from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Polio Elimination in the United States Report, September 28, 2021. In the 1950s, before polio vaccines were available, polio outbreaks caused more than 15,000 cases of paralysis each year. Following vaccines introduction, the number of polio cases fell rapidly to less than 100 in the 1960s and fewer by 10 by the 1970s. Mr. Speaker, from 15,000 to less than 100, that was the work of a vaccine. Mr. Speaker, vaccines caused the reign of terror of these diseases to end. A silver night which came to the rescue of millions around the world. The vaccines, Mr. Speaker, due to the advocacy work of humanitarian organizations such as Rotary International, the vaccines targeted towards these, towards these diseases were manufactured and distributed globally, thus ending the global pandemics. Up to this day, these vaccines are administered to infants to prevent the incidence of any of these diseases. Mr. Speaker, we need the jab. I am well aware that my colleagues on the opposing side of the House will discuss the implications of the legislation surrounding the mandating of vaccines. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to draw the attention of the members of the opposing side to the standing legislation on vaccinations here in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Here in Dominica, the notion of mandating vaccines is not foreign. The Compulsory Vaccination Act of 1922 of the Commonwealth of Dominica indicated where the compulsory vaccination site should be set up and specific activities that are barred due to the lack of vaccination. According to Section 12 of the said act, and I quote, no person who has not had the smallpox shall be employed in the police service unless vaccinated, nor shall any child in any medical district declared by order to be a compulsory vaccination area be permitted to become or be received as a pupil in any school within the state unless vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, this was one of the tools used to combat the incidence and spread of smallpox at that time, and it shows clearly the focal role that the vaccine has played, well, the vaccine played at that time. Mr. Speaker, if every member of this honorable house had to look at their upper forearm right now, I am certain that we would see a scar, every single member, a scar reflective of the decision that our parents made to have us protected as well as to enable us to access elementary education. Mr. Speaker, the Education Act of 1997 of the Commonwealth of Dominica shows the role of vaccines in the administration of schools up to this day. According to section 28, subsection 1D, and I quote, a child shall not be admitted to primary schools unless at the time of admission, a certificate issued by a registered medical practitioner or the public health authorities is produced, indicating that the child has been immunized, as may be prescribed by regulations made under this act, end quote. Mr. Speaker, this underscores the vital role vaccines have played in our society today and solidifies our stance as to why we need the job. Mr. Speaker, as the member of the proposing side responsible for the portfolio of youth development and empowerment, youth at risk, gender affairs, senior security, 
and Dominicans with disabilities, I recognize the impact that this pandemic has had. Mr. Speaker, we need the job to overcome all these heavy laden impacts on our most vulnerable society and sectors of society. Mr. Speaker, we need the job for our youth. The pandemic has greatly affected how young people learn and socialize. Mr. Speaker, are you aware that the last normal day of school, and again, normal day of school, was approximately two years ago? As per Section 9 of Environmental Health Services SRO of 2013, all schools were closed from March 23rd, 2020. From that point, the scope of learning changed from the traditional chalk and talk to the online and blended teaching methodologies. I would like to pause at this time to commend the hardworking teachers and principals for their efforts in making teaching and learning work during this time of uncertainty. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, schools are safe spaces for our students to learn and socialize. Socialization itself is a key stage in the development of any child. Mr. Speaker, as a teacher by profession, I can speak to this. Currently, we know students are coming back on a phased basis for learning, and you see the excitement the children have. You see that they need to be in school. They have been at home for months, and they've been frustrated. They've been stressed out. They are happy to be back at school. Socialization is key for any child. Not any child, for every single child. Parents have felt the strain of having the students home and in some instances, home on their own. Mr. Speaker, we would rather not think of what could happen to these youth in these times. Therefore, we need the job to get the students back to the comfort of the classroom. However, the classrooms can only be safe if the teachers and students are vaccinated. Recently, there was a closure of the primary school in Sufria. Due to COVID-19 transmission, Mr. Speaker, if we are to mandate that citizens are vaccinated, this would reduce the rate of transmission and avoid such circumstances like what occurred in the aforementioned primary school. Mr. Speaker, we need the job. The job is needed to get the youth back into the recreational spaces. The lockdowns, quarantines, isolations, and restrictions have had negative psychosocial impacts on our young people and the citizenry at large. A study conducted by Serakius et al. 2020, published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, cited the following as psychosocial challenges faced by the youth with chronic health conditions because of the COVID-19 pandemic. One, heightened health anxiety. Two, stress due to disrupted routines. Three, academic and social challenges associated with the closure of schools. Four, increased risk of family stress, domestic violence, and abuse. Five, reduced access to physical and psychosocial support. Mr. Speaker, these challenges can possibly have long-term effects on our youth. Effects that may trickle down even to the generations after them. With a vaccine mandate, we will be on our way to placing structures that would evade all the negative implications of these challenges. Mr. Speaker, let's use the Antigua model as something to demonstrate. Right now, the country has 61,550 persons vaccinated. The vaccine mandate was in effect for two months, from the 20th of September and after 1st October, if you didn't show up to work, no pay. During the first two weeks of the mandate, the first two weeks of the mandate, 20,000 Antiguan citizens were vaccinated. As of today, this country has less than five active cases. Vaccinated people do not require tests to enter and leave the country. Their schools have been face-to-face -face since September with no outbreaks. From a rate of infection from 6% to today, 
0.1%. Antiguans can enjoy limited restrictions on economic activity. As we see here, fet is fet. <laughs> well, party, fet is party. At the end of the day, the most vulnerable of the population in that country is protected because of that moment when COVID-19 vaccines were made mandatory. Mr. Speaker, the elderly are one of the most valuable resources any nation can have. These bright, beautiful souls provide wisdom and insight on issues currently affecting the nation, guided by the experiences they have lived through. Mr. Speaker, the Bible says in Job 12, chapter 12, verse 12, that wisdom is with the aged and understanding in the length of days. The good book also says in Leviticus 19, 32, that you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. As a Christian, God-fearing nation, it is our right to ensure that we protect this valuable yet vulnerable sector of our society. Mr. Speaker, I am not sure as so others felt, but my heart was in pieces when I saw the number of elderly lives lost in countries like Italy and even here in Dominica post the Delta surge. We heard it here in the house today. Dominica was known for the most centenarians per capita, 27. Post the Delta surge, we are now down to 15. 15 centenarians from 27. I will leave that for you to ponder on. Imagine the countless situations when we attend funerals in Dominica of our elderly. We see a closed casket because there is no viewing of the deceased if they died of COVID-19. A suffering family and a family member guilty of bringing the virus into the house because we know most of these, old, these elderly people remain home. You hear them lament at the funeral ground, had I known, or I should have taken the vaccine. One life lost to this dreaded disease is too much. Therefore, with vaccination being the norm for all citizens, we will be creating a society that is safer for the elderly, that they may stay on to share their wise words with us for even longer. Mr. Speaker, Dominicans living with disabilities have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As this particularly vulnerable segment of the population encompasses a variety of conditions and impairments, those with disabilities have faced many barriers throughout the pandemic. For instance, someone who is both hearing and speech impaired may read someone's lips to understand what they are saying to them. Mr. Speaker, we know what that means since the advent of masks. Additionally, we know the negative repercussions if they ask someone to lower their masks so that they can read their lips and that person themselves are infected with COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, some individuals may not be able to wear a standard surgical or procedural mask due to a disability or medical condition. This could lend to risky circumstances such as affecting the person's ability to breathe and sensory overload. Mr. Speaker, we need the job. Vaccines are a safe, proven method to create accommodating spaces for persons with health conditions, and we should act on this right away. Mr. Speaker, as I wind down, I would like to reemphasize my stance on this motion. After two years into a pandemic, we need to get ourselves well on the way to achieving some sort of normalcy. The mission of my ministry is to provide efficient and effective services geared towards the empowerment of Dominicans in their quest to contribute to individual, community, and national development. Shall promote healthy and active lifestyles through the provision of quality and appropriate facilities Programs and services in sports, physical education and recreation shall promote, develop, and preserve Dominica's cultural heritage and shall provide prompt, reliable, and economic postal services and the necessary support and resources to position constituents to contribute to the social, economic, cultural, educational, technological, and political development of their constituencies. 
thereby contributing towards the enhancement of the quality of life. We can only fulfill this mission by ensuring that there are policies that will provide opportunities and protection of our people. The implications of the pandemic need to be nipped in the bud before they are allowed to ferment and get out of control. Mr. Speaker, the vehicle that will carry us safely along this route to normalcy is vaccination. Vaccinations have been tried and tested. We ourselves have been inoculated and continue to inoculate our children as we know the importance of such action. Our youth, elderly, and citizens with disabilities help to elevate the uniqueness of our country and are very important to its success and prosperity. All in all, Mr. Speaker, we need the job. May God bless the members of this honorable house and may God bless the citizens and residents of the Commonwealth of Dominica. I thank you. The motion is now before the Honorable House for debate. Okay, so just a reminder, please, um, in the interest of the public, state your name, as well as the, the ministry or shadow ministry that you, you hold. Okay, um, you may proceed, Honorable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, while I deliver my contribution, may I refer to my notes? Yes, certainly. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to speak on the National Youth Parliament debate, topic number two. COVID-19 vaccines should be made mandatory for all citizens. My name is Zabadija Maxwell, and my ministerial portfolio is the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Youth Investment. There is a general divide as to whether or not COVID-19 vaccination should be made mandatory for all citizens. This would mean that all citizens, regardless of, let's say, health, age, religious inclinations, would be required by law to take the COVID-19 vaccine. And my colleagues and I take the stance that the COVID-19 vaccine should not be made mandatory for all citizens. The vaccine does not eliminate case spikes, since vaccinated individuals can catch and spread the virus. The vaccine wins off and booster shots has to be repeatedly taken. Additionally, natural immunity provides protection and there's data to prove that healthy individuals, as well as those with illness and underlying issues, do succumb to the uncommon but negative life-threatening side effects of the vaccine. Since our first case of COVID-19, the Ministry of Health collaborated with the other ministries and through the efforts of the staff and the citizens of the island, we recorded only 96 cases and zero deaths in 2020. For an entire year, we employed the tools in our health arsenal, namely the development of social distancing, the soil health protocols, which include the wearing of masks, sanitization, testing and quarantine, guarding our borders, as well as boosting the immune system, our immune systems with good diets, key vitamins such as zinc, vitamin C, D, magnesium, and our herbal medicine. Yes, we can never forget our bushes. So much so that for a period, zinc would not stay on pharmacy, pharmacy shelves. I would go to town to buy zinc for my mother, and I have to come back the next day or the next week, there will be no zinc on the shelves. This helped to reduce the spread, hospitalization, and prevent the loss of life to COVID-19. By the beginning of 2021, the Ministry of Health, as well as many citizens, welcomed the inclusion of the COVID-19 vaccines to its arsenal to help eliminate the virus and to return to a semblance of normalcy. This is evidence when within two months of the vaccine rollout, 17,674 people willingly took the jab. As the year progressed, it quickly became clear that the vaccine did not meet its function. The vaccinated were spreading and catching the disease so-called breakthrough cases became the norm. So the notion of stopping the spread and returning to normal was soon changed to hospitalization, limiting hospitalization and death. 
despite thousands of Dominicans taking the job by August 2021, for whatever scientific and social reasons, we saw an exponential surge in COVID-19 cases and a second lockdown and COVID-19 related deaths. As of Friday, March 18th, 2022, 29,907 citizens have had both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. That is 41.5%, Mr. Speaker. We have recorded and have a total of 11,745 COVID-19 cases, 11,452 recoveries, and 62 deaths. Since the vaccine does not stop the spread, how would a widespread, how, how, how would a widespread outbreak be controlled? What would be the purpose and outcome of mandating that the entire, the entire population be vaccinated? Mr. Speaker, the administration of vaccines to an individual should be left to the will of that person or guardian instead of obligation or force through the creation of a mandate. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky said in early August last year, that is August 5th, 2021, and I quote, our vaccines are working exceptionally well. They continue to work well for Delta with regard to severe illness and death, they prevent it. What they can't do anymore is prevent transmission, end quote. In a study published by the CDC, August 6, 2021, 469, that's a lot, Massachusetts residents were infected in a July outbreak. About 74% or 346 cases, a lot again, had been fully vaccinated. Of those cases, 79% reported symptoms. The premise that vaccinated individuals are less able to spread the virus, which should result in a decreased spike in cases, no longer holds. The unvax cannot be blamed for an increase in COVID cases when both groups can equally spread it. Mr. Speaker, case in point, China. China has vaccinated more than 2 billion of its population, yet Still, news reports from just last week, March 16th, 2022, informed that, and I quote, tens of millions of people are living under lockdown in China as the country battles its worst COVID-19 outbreak since the early days of the pandemic. Experts were cautioning that the situation was severe, end quote. This was from Jesse Young and CNN's Beijing Brew. Another example we should pay attention to is that of Israel, the world leader in vaccination and its efficacy. Data revealed that by, and I quote, August 2021, where 78% of those 12 and older have been fully vaccinated, mostly with the Pfizer or BioNTech vaccine, daily cases have surged in recent weeks and authorities have started to offer booster shots to older citizens, end quote. To date, the Israel Health News, March 2nd, 2022, has reported the following, and I quote, Professor Jacob Giris, director of Ichilov Hospital Coronavirus Ward, said in a TV interview that many of the severe cases are vaccinated. Between 70 and 80% of the serious cases are vaccinated. So the vaccine has no significance regarding severe illness, end quote. Another example, which shows that the vaccine mandate is not the way to go, is with the cruise industry. People all over the world want to get back to social and economic normalcy, and I do too. I'm sure we all do in here. Cruise tourism has begun, albeit with strict measures. All of the workers and passengers must be fully vaxxed as well as show evidence of a negative PCR or antigen test. Again, data show that even in this tightly and highly managed sector, fully vaxxed passengers and workers somehow developed COVID during the cruise. Mr. Speaker, allow me to give just three examples out of the many examples of the COVID, of the spread of COVID among the fully vaxxed cruises. Carnival Cruise, Carnival Vista, 27 positive cases, August 16th, 2021. Royal Caribbean Cruise, Symphony of the Seas, 48 positive cases, December 20th, 2021. Again, Royal Caribbean Cruise, Jewel of the Seas, 163 positive cases, January 9th, 2022. 
based on the definition and functions of a vaccine, having to take a booster shot several times a year, that's a treatment, not a vaccine, not a cure. Case in point, people are able to get reinfected or spread, say for example, chickenpox or measles, after they had either caught the disease or had taken a vaccine against it. Mr. Speaker, if you cannot catch it, there's no way you can spread it. In 2021, the Delta variant was a dominant strain. The vaccine was not created for that strain. Many countries are now reporting the Omicron variant. Can our scientists immediately create safe and effective vaccines to fight each emerging strain? And if they are able to do so, we must be careful as scientists are raising concerns over repeated boosting. As stated by Reuters, January 11, 2022, and I quote, the EMA official raised concerns that a strategy of, over, of giving boosters every four months hypothetically poses the risk of overloading people's immune system and leading to fatigue in the population, end quote. In addition, and I quote, while the use of, in, of additional boosters can be part of contingency plans, repeated vaccinations within short intervals would, re, would not represent a sustainable long-term strategy, end quote. That was from the European Medicines Agency, head of vaccine strategy, Marco Cavalleri. So now, given all these statistics, how can COVID-19 vax be mandated in this ever-changing world of the virus? The human body was created for an immune system which defends the body against infections and illnesses. What about those who have contracted the virus and have developed the antibodies to, needed to protect themselves? To mandate COVID-19 vaccine for the entire population is to suggest that our God-made immunity is second-class demands. How dare we? Statistics found that just over 40% of people who contract the virus are asymptomatic. Now, generally, this would include children, teens, and those in their prime, they tend to be asymptomatic. That is the immune system at work. Mr. Speaker, if you'll permit me to reference a study according to the Oregon Health and Science University, OSHU, in Portland, US, January 15th, January 25th, I apologize, and I quote, Antibodies derived from natural reinfection with COVID-19 are more abundant and more potent. At least 10 times more potent, this also includes infection, than immunity generated by vaccination alone." End quote. Mr. Speaker, allow me also to reference a conclusion of findings from a cohort of several survey participants in India titled, Natural Immunity Against COVID-19 Significantly Reduces the Risk of Reinfection. And I quote, these findings reinforce the strong plausibility that development of antibody following natural infection not only protects against reinfection by the virus to a great extent, but also safeguards against progression to severe COVID-19 disease, end quote. Dr. John Campbell supports this when he notes, and I quote, there is increasing evidence that immunity derived from natural infection if COVID-19 gives powerful protection on its own. Natural immunity has been shown to be both highly protective and long-lasting and to safeguard against both reinfection and severe disease, end quote. We cannot, we cannot ignore infection-acquired immunity, also known as natural immunity. To mandate and force a person who already has natural immunity from COVID-19 infection to take the jab is counterproductive and wasteful. Mr. Speaker, though many people are happy for the vaccine and the hope it brings, we can't deny that it is an experimental drug, especially one where there's not enough data on its safety. There are too many unknowns to force this on people, especially when there is no redress or compensation should they suffer unknown side effects. This is unethical. Those who weigh the risk and benefits and make uncursed decisions are establishing their bodily autonomy. It is their body. The government of Dominica does not own any man, woman, or child. How can we mandate that someone does what we want them to do with their body? Are we paying attention to the positive and negative side effects of the vaccine? 
to deny the negative side effects reported by individuals who willingly took the job is to continuously send a message that we, and create a mistrust in the healthcare system. It is to send a message to those who are still on the fence that their health does not matter. Mr. Speaker, please allow me to quote JAMA, that is the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I quote, vaccination against COVID-19 provides clear public health benefits, but vaccination also carries potential risk. Earlier on, Mr. Speaker, I quoted the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky. However, more and more evidence is emerging to show that statements like those about the safety of the vaccines are far from the truth. Contradictions are surfacing in the form of the vaccine trial papers and testimonials from people who can prove that their lives took a drastic turn after they take the jab. There has been a sudden increase in illnesses such as myocarditis, pericarditis, thrombosis, neurological issues, and even death. Many of these severe side effects have been recorded by VAERS, that is the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Now these are being verified in scientific journals and many medical organizations such as the CDC and scientific papers such as JAMA have released findings that, and I quote, the risk of myocarditis after receiving mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccines was increased across multiple age and sex strata and was highest after the second vaccination dose in adolescent males and young men, end quote. That's what's from JAMA, January 25th, 2022. Mr. Speaker, because the risk are unclear to some, should the government force a young man in his prime to play Russian roulette with the health of his heart? Does the risk of taking the jab or where the unknown benefit or children and young adults will get from taking the vaccine? Mr. Speaker, real people from all over the world have suffered and are suffering from severe side effects of the vaccine. Allow me to quote a report which originates from Jamaica. These reports were taken from Television Jamaica. On March 12, 2021, the broadcast, Side Effects of the Vaccine, featured Jamaica's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Bizarza McKenzie, and I quote, one day after the rollout of Jamaica's vaccination program, she assured the public there was no need for alarm concerning side effects from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Dr. McKenzie says that, there that she has not gotten any reports of a major reaction from the vaccine so far except for mal rash and itching. She says this is to be expected as if any other vaccine. Honorable member, you, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're welcome. End quotes. However, within eight months on December 28, 2021, a different tune was sung. Mr. Speaker, allow me to quote, and I quote, since the rollout in March, the Ministry of Health has received 738 reports from the public about possible side effects since taking the drug. These have been classified into what we could maybe deemed as serious and request requiring investigation. Head of the vaccine program, Dr. Melody Ennis, says there are 165 serious cases, including being hospitalized, be having medical complications, or even dying since taking the vaccine for AstraZeneca in that group. We have 142 we consider serious for Pfizer, 24 Johnson & Johnson, five Jamaicans have reported very rare but serious anaphylactic shock, four people have developed Bell's palsy, which, is, which causes the muscle weakening and paralysis of the face, while 21 people reported thrombosis, that is blood clots. Mr. Speaker, if we mandate the mass vaccination of the population, will due diligence be carried out? Medicine cannot be one size fits all. There is a reason why doctors pay attention to their patient's medical profile before prescribing a particular medication to that person. To not do so is medical malpractice, Mr. Speaker. To mandate the vaccination of an entire population is to toss out the window this essential practice of determining the suitability of a medication on an individual. Will those with natural immunity be exempt? Will it be mandated that doctors check underlying conditions such as allergic reactions and heart disease so as to exempt those who may be at risk of taking the vaccine? Can the families, the government, and the country afford a generation's worth of health, social, and economic issues brought on by the vaccine? 
Overall, the COVID-19 vaccine should not be made mandatory for all citizens, as the vaccine does not guarantee either cure or protection. In that, with or without the vaccine, contracting COVID-19 is still a possibility. Death from COVID-19, though small, it is still a possibility. After all, protection and prevention is always better than cure, particularly when cure cannot be guaranteed. This is why instead of making the vaccine mandatory, it is essential that citizens be encouraged to practice healthy liberty, wear their face masks, employ social distancing, perform sanitization, test according to protocol, and if one is willing and has made the thorough, confident decision, utilize the vaccines or not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I, I recognize um, Honorable Stefina Martin. Yes, um, Honorable Martin, you, you may proceed. Mr. Speaker, I, Stefina Martin Williams, rise to make my rise to add my voice to the proposed bill that COVID-19 vaccines should be made mandatory for all citizens. Permit me to read a quote and to reference notes during my speech, Mr. Speaker. We are encouraged by the rollout of safe and effective vaccines, but the truth is simple. No person is safe until all, until everyone, until everywhere are safe. And no country is safe until all countries are safe. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. It is with this quote in mind, Mr. Speaker, that I stand in full solidarity with the proposed bill which states that COVID-19 vaccines should be made mandatory for all citizens. My support is hinged on the premise that there will be a lower rate of transmission, less strain on the healthcare sector, and a significant reduction in the financial burden on the economy. By the end of my presentation, I am confident that the general consensus will be that a COVID-19 vaccine mandate is a step in the right direction in protecting our citizens, protecting our economy, and developing dynamic Dominica. Before I proceed into the heart of my presentation, Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that all participants of this honorable house, and indeed, every, Dominica, every Dominican home and abroad, receive some clarity on the more critical terms found within this bill. Mr. Speaker, the opposition have attempted to strike fear into the hearts of the people and have hung their concerns on the use of the word all. But as we all know, Mr. Speaker, knowledge is power. And as the good book states in Hosea 4 and verse 6, people perish for a lack of knowledge. So. I wish to send out an olive branch filled with knowledge to the opposition as it relates to mandating COVID-19 vaccines. The bill states that all citizens should be vaccinated. And of course, I totally see the cause for concern on several fronts. On this side of the house, Mr. Speaker, we are fully aware that there are persons who for health reasons or religious beliefs, are simply unable to be vaccinated. However, we live in the 21st century. The advancement of technology is applicable. We see it every day that technology has indeed advanced. So therefore, do not fear my worthy opponents. There will be a vaccine for that. Also, this is where the concept of herd immunity comes in. Herd immunity occurs when the majority of citizens are vaccinated and they are then able to protect those who are not. So the minister before me on the opposing side, the Minister of Health, she made a reference to, to China when she said, um, I think two billion persons are vaccinated. The question is, has that country reached herd immunity? What is the population of China? I recall Elizabeth Israel, affectionately known as Mapampo, known to be one of the longest-lived persons in the world. 
In her interview, she was 103 years old, and yet she still boasted of being able to eat her hard fig and dashin. Indeed, she was healthy and strong well past 100 years. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, Dominica has the second highest, the second highest longevity in the Western Hemisphere, second only to Canada, according to Janice Jackson, Executive Director of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. So that just goes to show, Mr. Speaker, that we can, in fact, successfully implement a vaccine mandate because the majority of our population are in good health. So when we speak about different um, immune systems and persons with compromised immune system, the majority of Dominicans are in good health. We are strong, resilient people. Moreover, a vaccine mandate will allow for our citizens to become their brother's keepers, as taking the vaccine will inadvertently protect the lives of others who are unable to make that choice for themselves, such as the newborns. The World Health Organization confirms this by stating that when a lot of people in a community are vaccinated, the pathogen has a hard time circulating because most of the people it encounters are immune. As a small island nation, the onus is on us all to look out for each other, to protect those who are weak. But Mr. Speaker, we have failed, and we have failed miserably. The current infection rate is all the evidence needed, and so we are left with the only viable option of passing a vaccine mandate. Mr. Speaker, if our citizens will not seize the opportunity to look out for and to protect their brothers, their sisters, their grandparents, their children, then the brunt of the responsibility lies on the state to protect them all. Moreover, the World Health Organization further reiterated that unvaccinated people have at least 10 times serious, 10 times higher risk of death from COVID-19 than someone who has been unvaccinated. 10 times, Mr. Speaker, 10 times. One of the most important questions I encountered during this preparation is how does the COVID-19 vaccine work? And my colleague before the Honorable Winston made mention to this, but just to go in depth as the Minister for Health, Wellness, and New Health Development, I will do so. When the human body is exposed to an antigen for the first time, it takes time for that immune system to respond and produce antibodies specific to that anti antigen. However, let us look at it as a race, and scientists haven't beaten the virus in reaching our, body, on our bodies. So, as opposed to waiting for the virus to attack us, for us to receive herd immunity, for us to receive, sorry, natural immunity, scientists have developed a weapon, Mr. Speaker, a Smith & Wesson 9mm or an AK-47 fully loaded and waiting to stop the virus when it dares try to attack us. That, that weapon is the vaccine. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister from the opposite side mentioned regarding our natural herbs, our vitamins, and boosting our immune system. And of course, we, are, we totally agree. We are not saying that you should stop taking your vitamins and stop taking you know, your local herbs. But what we are saying, imagine, the, imagine you having the vaccine, and imagine your body already building a resistance toward the COVID-19. When the COVID-19 comes with the vaccine plus your immune system, COVID-19 cannot touch us in Dominica. It cannot touch us. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, the opposition may also share concern regarding the time frame in which the vaccines were developed. And this view has been echoed by some of our citizens. However, let me inform you, Mr. Speaker, as I have reminded so many others that we are living in the 21st century. I mean, it's to see us when a cooking match come into play or when we're watching football. When I sit down on my couch with my red jersey, nobody cannot tell me I am not in England. Technology, Mr. Speaker, the advancement in technology has allowed us to share that passion, that excitement right from our, right from our couches as if we were in the stands. 
The WHO is an organization which has been in effect since 1948, Mr. Speaker, an organization that is trustworthy and reliable and whose words we have never questioned before, said that scientists were able to develop a safe COVID-19 vaccines in a relatively short amount of time due to a combination of factors that allow them to scale up research and production without compromising safety. Factor number one was because COVID-19 was a global pandemic, there was a larger sample size as ten, tens of thousands of volunteers stepped forward. In addition, a pediatrician at NYU Children's Hospital stated that since the initial release, millions and millions of doses have been administered and the COVID-19 vaccine is found to be safe, in, safe and effective in preventing severe illness and hospitalization. Factor number two, Mr. Speaker, is the advancements in technology like the mRNA vaccines that were years in the making. The mRNA technology behind the COVID-19 vaccination has been studied for over a decade with the first SARS and MERS coronavirus outbreak in 2003. At that time, scientists began to develop and study a vaccine for possible future use. It is important to note that vaccine trials and testings were not modified or shortened in order to approve the COVID-19 vaccine. What was indeed expedited was the time given between the trials. Factor number three, Mr. Speaker, is that governments and other bodies came together to remove the obstacle of funding and research. We are funding research and development, sorry. We all know that money plays an important role in everything. However, in the development of COVID-19, however, in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, time was saved as the cash was there. So there was no need for any proposals to be written or grant funds to be sought in order to develop the vaccine. And we all know how long that can take. It was a simple matter of making transfers and signing checks to purchase ingredients and other testing materials for the vaccine. Chop, 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 Mr. Speaker, chop, chop, chop. So whilst we think they have not been working, they have. They have been working tirelessly to develop a vaccine to help us. And after all their hard work, after all their time, we refuse to take the vaccine. It grieves my heart, Mr. Speaker, because on one hand, we are in the middle of a pandemic that we need to get, to get out of. And on the other hand, we have a tool to help us, but we are refusing that tool, thus adding an enormous amount of strain to our economies and healthcare sector. In doing so, we are making a conscious decision to risk the lives of the innocent, to risk the lives of the elderly, and to risk the lives of the incapacitated. As the Minister for Health, Wellness, and New Health Investment, it would be remiss of me not to expound of the impact that this virus has had on our healthcare sector. Mr. Speaker, our government has invested enormously and is still investing enormously to the health sector in Dominica. We have seen the recent renovation of the Dominica China Friendship Hospital, the Marigot Hospital, and construction and renovation of 12 new health and wellness centers around Dominica. It is undeniable, Mr. Speaker, that the government has been doing its part in ensuring that citizens receive full access to health and the best possible care there is. However, Mr. Speaker, from the arrival of COVID-19 in March 2020 to present, there has been 62 reported COVID-related deaths 12 of whom were centenarians, a fate which could have easily been avoided. And Honorable Winston mentioned earlier how, how valuable our elderly are. We need to protect our elderly at any cost. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago made mention at a training at the Kabritz Kempensky Resort and Spa that the notion of compulsory vaccination may have some appeal. However, 
It really makes for social harmony and contented citizens. And that is why the government has refrained from impl implementing such mandates. But instead, they have adopted constructive engagement, public education, moral suasion, and open discourse. Hoping, Mr. Speaker, hoping that larger sections of the public will make use of the vaccines in their own interest and for their own protection. But two years later, where has that gotten us? We were one of the first Caribbean countries to receive COVID-19 vaccines, and to date, only 41% have been fully vaccinated. Currently, we have seven different types of vaccines on the island, Mr. Speaker and we have yet to reach herd immunity. It is time to fight COVID-19 the effective way by mandating vaccinations. Our nurses are tired. Our health staff are overworked. Our doctors are exhausted, all because the government is failing to provide solutions to alleviate their workloads. Mr. Speaker, I have been pri privileged to witness the impact of COVID-19 from the vantage point of a frontline worker. I have heard the cries of nurses being away from their families for months, having to count the number of days in the week they get to see their children, all because they are on the other end of the country. I have constantly witnessed the cries of mothers being separated from their children for days, Mr. Speaker. Imagine a child being so emotionally attached to you that they demand to come and see you at a facility, crying, bawling down the place, as we locals say it, and that pain of that mother of not being able to hug her child and reassure her child that mommy is here. That is a pain, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, you have five minutes left for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're welcome. Mr. Speaker, imagine mere minutes after visiting or talking to your loved one in a facility you are faced with the heartbreaking news that they have passed on. These are local stories. These are local experiences of the effects of fighting COVID-19 feebly, of the effects of leaving vaccination up to the public and not mandating COVID-19 vaccinations. And whilst you may argue opponents that the choice is theirs and a vaccine does not have to be mandated, and my colleague will expound on this in a bit. I humbly remind you that a government, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is a selected group of people with the authority to govern a country or state. A government is for the people, for the best interest of all citizens, to protect their, their, their citizens by making the best possible decision in every situation, and keyword, even when it conflicts human rights. That, my friends, is the power of the government. Finally, Mr. Speaker, the government to date has spent millions of dollars in the case against COVID-19. These monies could have been invested in some other sectors had the majority of the population taken the vaccine. Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, our government has tried to be subtle with this issue. But the fact remains that had we obtained herd immunity after the first wave of the virus, there would have been economic growth, there would have been normalcy, and some of our loved ones would have still been here today. In the Prime Minister's 2020-2021 budget presentation, which he titled, The Road to a Dynamic Dominica, fostering economic resilience. Reference was made to an assessment and forecast by the International Monetary Fund that the Dominica economy was set to expand by 5.5, 4.5, 3.6% for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022, respectively. However, merely two months after that projection came, the world faced a global shutdown and the revised economic growth projections for developing countries were minus 1.0% for 2020. Mr. Speaker, just think about it for a second. 
We are in a global crisis where our economy was expected to expand by 5.5% and is no longer able to expand. Rather, it will decrease, coupled with citizens losing their jobs as a result of the pandemic, small businesses unable to open, bus drivers being restricted in the number of passengers they can carry, farmers unable to sell any produce, the ports being closed, restricted traveling for months, Mr. Speaker. The government has had to use their resources to help those directly affected by this pandemic and still find money to open quarantine facilities, still find money to pay for citizens' medication and provide meals. Mark Wessa, Mr. Speaker, alas, this is too much. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, you, you have just about one more minute to, to wind up your presentation. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, we should, all, we should all live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. If you members of the opposition are trying to feed your child, your sister, your cousin, or whoever that person may be, and they insist on throwing away the food, you are left with only two options. Either one, you stop giving them the food. But two, because of nourishment purposes and because you love that relative, you have no choice but to tie their hands and forcefully feed them because you love them and because you want what's best for them. The same principle applies here, Mr. Speaker. It is time that the nation realizes that the government simply cannot continue to acquire additional debt when there is a viable alternative. Herd immunity has to be achieved. How longer can we neglect the needs of our citizens because we have to all allocate an exorbitant amount of money to COVID-19? I have heard stories of individuals being turned down for public assistance, all because of COVID-19. And Mr. Speaker, may I just add here that my opponents may argue also that the current number of active cases has decreased. And as a result, several COVID hospitals in the Postmark community has been recently closed. Hence, the majority of staff has returned to their dwelling homes, and this enables the government to divert their resources to other sectors and projects around Dominica. So the need for a vaccine mandate is unnecessary. However- uh, Honorable member, I, I don't mean to cut you short, but um, you have exhausted the, the 20 minutes allocated for your presentation. Motion for the Honourable Member to have an additional two minutes. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the Honourable Member be given an additional two minutes to complete her, her presentation. Those in favour? Those against? The ayes have it. Honorable Martin, you, you may continue. Thank Two you, minutes. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my team members. So I was saying that um, the opponents may argue that, you know, we close down some facilities, so there's no need for a vaccine mandate. However, Mr. Speaker, ma vaccine mandate is necessary now and even more necessary as before because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Our ports are fully opened to vaccinated and unvaccinated travelers. And therefore, ensuring that we obtain herd immunity will protect us from a third or from a fourth wave. Just last year, I mean, life was sweet in the Commonwealth. We were almost back to normalcy. And on August 6th, the Prime Minister released a statement indicated that there were 103 positive cases 90% of which were unvaccinated. Curfews were, un were enforced, shutdowns begin, began, and the two months of normalcy we enjoyed were gone out the window. We cannot, Mr. Speaker, we simply cannot afford to let our guards down until herd immunity is achieved. And we need to mandate vaccinations and we, need to, and we need to mandate vaccinations to achieve this, as the lenient efforts we have been trying is simply and honestly not enough. Mr. Speaker, let me remind the opposition that fighting mandatory vaccination equates to you fighting against herd immunity. Fighting mandatory vaccination equates to you fighting 
against normalcy. Fighting mandatory vaccination equates to you fighting economic development. Fighting ma mandatory vaccination equates to you fighting against families and fighting against the preservation of lives of your loved ones, of our loved ones, and of citizens of the Commonwealth of Dominica. I thank you. Yes, I recognize Honorable Adams. You may commence your presentation. Mr. Speaker, permission to remove my mask and ask to obtain the mini podium, please. Yes, permission granted. Honorable Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Chair of the Youth Parliament, VP Firelander, Honorable Leaders of the proposing and opposing sides, Mr. Hanif Gregoire and Ms. Lakia Joseph, the esteemed youth members of the Parliament, distinguished guests, media and viewers, good evening to all. Standing before you is Cornelia Adams, the Shadow Minister for Youth Development, Empowerment, Youth at Risk, Gender Fears, Senior Security, and Dominicans with Disabilities. Mr. Speaker, on this historical day, I will be debating on the topic, should COVID-19 vaccines be made mandatory for all citizens? Mr. Speaker, we, the opposing team, in this debate, believe that the COVID-19 vaccines should not be made mandatory. Mandatory, as defined by the Collins Dictionary, is something that is required by law, mandated, obligatory, or compulsory. There is no evidence in our Constitution that taking the COVID-19 vaccine is a must. Mr. Speaker, allow me to define democracy. Democracy as defined by the Oxford language as a form of government in which the people have the authority to deliberate and decide legislations or to choose government officials to do so. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, while I deliver my contribution, can I refer to my notes? Yes, that's no problem. You may proceed. In an article regarding to the arrival of vaccines made by GIS, the Government Information Services stated that, and I quote, with enough doses of COVID-19 vaccines on island to inculate over 50% of the population, citizens are continually being encouraged to avail themselves for vaccination. This, as a government of Dominica, through the Ministry of Health, Wellness, New Investments, continues to outroll of a massive and comprehensive vaccination program in fight against the COVID-19 virus. 70,000 doses of AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine arrived in Dominica on Tuesday, 9th February 2021 from the government of India, while 20,000 doses of Sinopharm vaccines donated by the People's Republic of China arrived Thursday, 4th of March 2021. Mr. Speaker, in that same article, the Prime Minister, Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, described Dominica as fortunate. As there are many countries with no access to vaccines, we understand. He then praised the citizens who have already taken the opportunity to get vaccinated while urging others to make themselves available for the ongoing program. When situations occur in which unwanted events are rightly or wrongly connected with vaccines, they may erode confidence in vaccines and the authority delivering them. 
Mr. Speaker, in a recent youth parliament session held by the Dr. Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt on Saturday, 12 March 2022, the Prime Minister stated that, and I quote, the government of Dominica at this time is not contemplating mandatory vaccines on any cohort of society, not even for our school students. This administration has developed constructive engagement, public education, moral solutions, and open discussions instead of compelling our citizens to get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister is opposing mandatory vaccine, who, who, who really is the other side? So talk so much come and mandate vaccines. In that same statement, the Prime Minister made mention that we continue to up sections in society to use vaccines for their best interest and protection. To my colleagues and I on this valuable opposition side, Mr. Speaker, it is evident that if one wishes to be vaccinated, it should be by morals and it should be by choice. And the government is not mandating vaccines on its citizens, however, wants persons to take the responsibility for their health and the health of their fellow countrymen. Mr. Speaker, it simply means you can bring a horse to a well, but you cannot force it to drink. This same principle avails to vaccines. Yes, it's available, but you cannot force people to take what they don't want to take, Mr. Speaker. Making vaccines compulsory is not the only way to obtain high vaccination rates. Mr. Speaker, what the other side failed to mention, the main function of the COVID-19 virus is not to prevent the virus, but to serve to develop antibodies in immune response in order to lessen infection and transmission of this deadly virus. COVID-19 vaccines should not be made mandatory, Mr. Speaker. There will be resistance. It could prove counterproductive. We may not just yet explore other options. Yes, they might say the vaccines are available, it, it, is, it is in abundance. But Mr. Speaker, mandating vaccines, we can do better than that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the emergence of COVID-19 vaccine resistance depends on human choices. Yes, as mentioned by Honorable Gregor, vaccination has been the most successful tool in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. However, the continued viral elevation of SARS-CoV-2 strains raises concern the vaccine resistance will emerge. Mr. Speaker, aljazeera.com news in an article sourced that on January 9th, 2022, anti-vaccine protesters rallied in France, Germany, Australia, and Italy. Protesters have taken to the streets across Western Europe in protest against COVID-19 re vaccine requirements. With more than 100,000 people rallying in France alone to oppose what they call the government's plan to restrict the rights of the unvaccinated. Al Jazeera.com news stated in an article on December 5th, 2021, Belgian police fired water cannons on Sunday to dispel protesters opposed to compulsory health measures against the corona pandemic. Mr. Speaker, no one, and I mean no one, in this hard passion fruit season, Mr. Speaker, should be belittled or unfairly dismissed from, a, from employment for, or social activities because they are not vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, not even Napoleon could force everyone to get vaccinated in terms of smallpox. With all due respect, Mr. Speaker, in our little Dominica, a peaceful nation where our people are given a voice and a choice, we need not 
to stir violence and mandating vaccines will cause unwanted social problems. Mr. Speaker, the point is, whatever approach the government decides to take, there will be opposition, and this is why we are here today. <laughs> COVID restrictions have drawn physical protests around the world, and mandating vaccines will surely do the same here. Mr. Speaker, if you're looking for war, as the proposing side to mandate vaccines, Mr. Speaker, I withdraw the statement. Oh. <laughs> France24.com sourced. France has postponed implementing COVID-19 vaccines mandate for health workers in Martinique and Guadeloupe after the major spread widespread protests on the French territories in which police officers were injured and journalists were, were attacked. Mr. Speaker, I look around and I see so much journalists here today. You think after we mandate vaccine, one of them wouldn't get a cool booter in the head? <laughs> in, in, in turn by cool booter, I, I mean a uh, whip to the head. Mr. Okay, Speaker. thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, rip, just some translate for me, please. What did you say? Excuse me? A cool bouté. Uh, also means like a uh, 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 two by four in the head. Uh, 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 yes, thank you very much, Honourable Member. You may you may proceed, Mr. Speaker. That is just distraction. BBC News on August 6, 2021, reported that the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have been hospitalized after being injured at a protest against the proposed vaccine mandate. Mr. Speaker, permit me to ask the other side. Is this something that we really want for a peaceful nation? Can we really handle the outcome Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis will not mandate vaccines against COVID-19. Prime Minister Harris featured in the news on St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service on August 25, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the government and the people of St. Kitts for being the first Caribbean country to be recognized as a fully nation, fully vaccinated nation as of 2022, with 49% of the population fully vaccinated and without a vaccine mandate. Mr. Speaker, however, our colleagues in Antigua and Barbuda, as mentioned by the Honorable Winston, <clears throat> Antigua have the highest vaccination rate in the Caribbean because the government mandated vaccines on all government workers. Mr. Speaker, I wish to ask, is it a fundamental right that a person takes a vaccine just to keep their job, just to feed their family? Ah, how do you sleep at night knowing there are persons who are unfairly dismissed from their jobs for not being on vaccinated, Mr. Speaker? Margaret, <sighs> Mr. Speaker. Mandatory schemes during a crisis will prove counterproductive. Dr. Dickley Bodman, an EDP immunologist, advised the World Health Organization on pandemic recovery, told Al Jazeera. When people have what we call conspiracy theories, or they have misbelief or misunderstanding, such as schemes, will only strengthen their opinion. Mr. Speaker, citizens will be hesitant in taking vaccines simply because of religious exemptions, health issues, or lack of education on vaccines. Mr. Speaker, after being aware of the topic debating at hand today, I took to the media and to the streets. Preferably, my organization, the Youth Emergency Action Committee, and I asked some of my members, what is your views 
on mandatory vaccines. Mr. Speaker, things are bad. I heard my body, my choice. I'll take the vaccine when I'm ready. Mr. Speaker, the one that stood out was, I don't like people to force me to do what I know I have to do. Mr. Speaker, while there will always be some who will never be persuaded to get vaccinated, it is possible to be skeptical about vaccinations without being an anti-vaxxer. What religious, what religions have doctrinal reasons for being unvaccinated? Religious actors have a large role to play, particularly in addressing challenges centered around COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, some religious leaders are critically involved in encountering hate speech, misinformation, and in addressing vaccination uptakes associated in this crisis. Mr. Speaker, does the other side even consider the views of people with history of severe allergic reactions to components? Honorable member, you have five more minutes. Permission to. I second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that the honorable member be given an additional five minutes to complete her presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Uh -huh. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, my Mr. Speaker, allow me to add, mandated vaccines may provoke distrust. The reasons that we think may explain why a government mandate may make people more resistant to vaccine. First, people resist being manipulated, Mr. Speaker. Second, people may be affected by what psychologists call moral disengagement. This happens when people think that the decision is predetermined by explicit rules or incentives so that their own ethical convictions are not relevant. The political scientist Eleanor Ostrom described how good citizenship can get crowded out when the government takes responsibility for doing the right thing. Something like this may be happening with vaccines, with enforced vaccines crowding out electric, illustrative motivations. Mr. Speaker, my final point in this debate is a possibility that we have not just yet explored other options. While there is high agreement in favor for mandating vaccines, it is not the only way. What is quite noticeable in the past is how politicians do like the idea of mandating vaccines because it may seem to give the quickest way out of a problem, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't want the government to neglect other things that could be done to, to sh ensure that our, our citizens are vaccinated. But Mr. Speaker, let me draw your attention to more options instead of mandating vaccines. One, by simply encouraging but not requesting citizens to get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, you know one thing I hate? When I see dishes in the sink at home, and I'm put, literally offering my service to wash them, and then my mother comes and say, Wash those dishes. That's because I have no taste in washing the dishes again. <laughs> Two, to encourage citizens to get vaccinated. For instance, offering appreciation bonus to those who actually got the shots or tacking a surcharge on health premiums for those who don't get shots. In relation to employees, Host more on-site vaccination clinics for employees and their family. Mr. Speaker, this takes away challenges and have proven to be effective in increasing vaccination rates. Mr. Speaker, how does one enter this honorable house to mandate vaccines when there are actual members on the other side who aren't even vaccinated? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, with the first arrival of the vaccine, I took the decision to get vaccinated immediately. 
Is a speaker you'd swear to me I bring down the vaccine from India because I dash for my, my job. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am vaccinated by choice. My mother didn't force me. I didn't get no cool out to go and get vaccinated. No political affiliation um, sent me to get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, I vaccinated myself by choice. Mr. Speaker, we are told that good health is good development. But in building resilient Dominica, the question leads, should all people have a voice or a choice? I am pleading to the government to not mandate the COVID-19 vaccines. Dominica is a peaceful nation with people who do things on their own personal agenda and time, Mr. Speaker. Allow us to avoid, or let us avoid the results of restraint. Let us correct or lessen counterproductive, and let us explore other options, Mr. Speaker, instead of mandating vaccines. I am not against the COVID-19 vaccines, or any vaccines, in fact. What I will not support or stand for, Mr. Speaker, is mandating the COVID-19 vaccines for all citizens. This should be a choice, a willing choice, Mr. Speaker. When we were young, we were taught right from wrong. Mr. Speaker, taking the COVID-19 vaccine is right and necessary to put an end to this, va to this pandemic, but it is wrong to force a mandatory vaccine on all citizens, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this, this, this other side will come to you and say, mandate vaccines because it's necessary. But Mr. Speaker, we the opposing side do not stand for mandatory vaccines. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Dominica. that the house stands suspended until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Seconded, Mr. Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that this house be adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Aye. The ayes have it. This house stands suspended until tomorrow. <laughs>